Good evening. Uh, welcome to the, what is today? Sorry, thank you. April 6th, meeting of the planning board. Um, our first item of business is to re review and approve minutes. I have minutes from February 2nd, 2023 and March 16th, 2023. Is there any questions or comments relative to the minutes? Steve? No comments, other than I wasn't here for March. Okay. Yeah, uh, no comments on the March 6th one. Mm -hmm. Sorry, uh, Kevin's the name was included, so he was not present, I think. March 6th. Yeah, yeah. 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 We can, so we can with that, that amendment, I think we should okay. be all set. I do not either. I'll entertain a motion. I move that we approve the minutes from the February 2nd, 2023 and March 16th, 2023 meetings of the Planning Board. Do I have a second? Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 I'm abstaining. Okay. Next item of business is to review and sign bills. I have uh, a few bills here. First one from Graves Engineering, 701 Boston Turnpike, second and third site plan review for $2,766.25. Graves Engineering 295 Green Street, site plan review, $2,267.87. MDM Transportation Consultants Incorporated, 701 Boston Turnpike, traffic review for $5,400, totaling $10,434.12. Do I have a motion? I move that we authorize the expenditures as just read by the chair. Do I have a second? Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Okay, next item, item of business is board member comments. Um, we kind of messed, uh, changed it up a little bit. I'll start with you, Perna. Any yeah, questions uh, or comments? No comments, Mr. Chairman, for this. Mr. Thomas. I have no comments this month, sir. Mr. Iliadi. No comments. Mr. Jerry. I have no comments. Mr. Rodelakis. No comments this month, Mr. And Mr. I have no comments either. So our first item of business is a new public meeting. It's for a proposed building and utility separation and EV charges request for de minimis change for Cornerstone Bank, location 195 Main Street. I'm gonna recuse myself. Oh, Mr. Rodel okay, re excuse me, Mr. Rodelakis is recusing himself. Please Thank you, Mr. Chairman, members of the board. Um, John Grenier is supposed to be with me here tonight, but you do have, I think, a, a plan in your file that shows in the red lines where the changes have been made. Um, all of these changes are the result of the pre-construction meeting that uh, took place uh, at the town hall. Um, it's, I know it's a little concerning to you that we're back here again for de minimis, but let me say that all of these different departments had the opportunity while we were going through the process to put in their two cents, as you know. Um, and these things came up only at the pre-construction meeting. So we've made the changes. Um, we, because of the DPW wanted to have two utility lines in for the, for the um, uh, sprinkler system, obviously we're doing that. Um, we reduced the size of the canopy uh, to separate the buildings because uh, that was a request uh, to facilitate the maneuvering of emergency vehicles. Uh, that was at, uh, I believe, the fire department's request. And as you know, we have a new uh, bylaw or regulation coming in about EV charging stations. Um, and by the time this property is fully developed, uh, that regulation will come into effect. So the, the third change has to do with adding the spaces and the EV stations pursuant to that. I know we could have asked for grandfathering, but we might as well get it done while, while we're doing it. So um, those are the three changes. and, and Frankly, I hope you would consider these de minimis. Uh, the plan still remains the same. It's still a bank and, and the retail building, and nothing has changed in that respect. We've just reduced, as I say, the size of the canopy and adjusted things to meet the requests of uh, uh, two departments, frankly. Very good. Thank you. Um, any questions or comments from the board? Mr. Iliati? No. Mr. Jerry? None. Mr. Thomas? None. No comments. <laughs> I don't either, I, and, and I agree with you. Um, I know. Multiple de minimis changes tend to be frowned upon. I hate to do it. I really, I hated to do it, but it, it, However, in this case, it's understandable, and I understand with the new regulations coming down, it's going right. to have an impact. So fortunately, now people have a little bit more foreknowledge that this is going to be a, a component. So yeah. those that haven't brought 
plans before us, understand that that will be something you need to consider. So Correct. All right, so um, I, I think this fits in de minimis. Does anybody think otherwise? I agree, Mr. Mayor. Okay, so I'll entertain a motion. I move that we uh, approve the de minimis changes as presented for proposed building utility separation and EV charges for Cornerstone Bank at 195 Main Street. Do I have a second? Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Thank you very Thank much. You. Thank you. Hopefully that's the last one. We'll see. Yeah. Oh, it, it will be. No. <laughs> I'm teasing. Okay. Our next public hearing is a new public hearing. For a proposed office building and site improvements, site plan modification, Shrewsbury Crossing 2 LLC. Location is 571 Boston Turnpike. Mr. Thomas, could you please read the public notice? The Shrewsbury Planning Board will hold a public hearing on Thursday evening, April 6, 2023, at 7 p.m. in the event presentation room at Shrewsbury High School, 64 Holden Street, to hear the application of Shrewsbury Crossing 2 LLC, 100 MLK Jr. 550. P.O. Box 646, Worcester, Mass. 01613. For site plan modification by the Planning Board as required by the Town of Shrewsbury Zoning Bylaw Section 7F3. Construct a new 8,400 square foot office building as shown as on plans entitled Proposed Site Plan Develop Documents for Shrewsbury Crossing 2 LLC. Dated March 6, 2023. Prepared by Bowler Engineering, 352 Turnpike Road, South Row, Mass. 01772. Stamped by John A. Kuwich. PE consisting of 27 sheets. The subject pro project is located on the southeast portion of the property located near the intersection of Grafton Street and Route 9 and consists in whole or in part of Shrewsbury Assessor's Tax Plate 34, Plot 024001. Copy of the application and plans may be seen in the Office of the Planning and Economic <coughs> Development Department at the Richard D. County Municipal Office Building, 100 Maple Avenue, Shrewsbury, Mass., and on the Planning Board website. Thank you. Proponent, please introduce yourself. Uh, good evening, Mr. Chair, members of the board. Uh, am, am I mic'd up? I think your mic is up there. I don't know. Can anyone in the audience here? Is this the mic? Yeah, I think that's the mic. Okay, great. Excellent. Uh, so, for the record, my name is Joshua Lee Smith. I'm an attorney with the law firm of Bottage and Dewey. Um, here this evening, representing the applicant, uh, <clears throat> Shrewsbury Crossing 2 LLC, in connection with this petition. Uh, we are seeking a, a modification of a previously approved uh, definitive site plan uh, with respect to this uh, location, which is, uh, we will get into a little bit more detail with respect to the project scope. Um, but as, as you can see from the aerial here, and with me this evening as well are representatives uh, of the applicant um, uh, who will also be speaking on this, on this petition. Uh, we have a, a brief slide deck, and we promise to, to be as uh, brief as possible. This, this project is relatively straightforward. Um, I'm sure most of the members and, and the public are aware of, uh, of this site and have probably frequented it at various uh, tenants that are located at this site. Uh, this is a shopping center. Um, the property is about 12 acres in size. Uh, what you're looking at here is a depiction of uh, two shopping centers. Um, the shopping center that is actually the subject of tonight's um, of, of this application is the shopping center on the on the right. Uh, the shopping center on the left is uh, owned by a different owner, uh, and um, is the the two interplay to the extent that there is a reciprocal reciprocal easement agreement. Uh, but that's that's the extent to which they um, have a relationship. So, I will advance to the next slide, and as you can see here, this is a slightly uh, so this is the, the shopping center. We refer to it as Shrewsbury Crossing 2. Um, the, this property, this lot, is it's approximately 12 acres in size, located in the Commercial B, uh, Commercial Business, uh, or CB Zoning District. Uh, it's not within any overlay districts. Uh, the shopping center itself is comprised of uh, various retailers, including working gear, uh, staples, as well as most recently, uh, at home. Um, <clears throat> the property is surrounded uh, by a mix of other retailers, uh, restaurants uh, to, the, to the right or to the east is uh, the Buihana uh, restaurant and as well as I believe it's a Meineke dealership. This is, is clearly one of the, the town's uh, main commercial corridors. So what the applicant is proposing uh, is the construction and development of an approximately 8,400 square foot building. Uh, this building is going to be the 
new uh, building for Fidelity Investments, which Fidelity is located at the, at the Westerly Shopping Center uh, next to uh, the Japanese restaurant. So Fidelity has outgrown that space. They're looking to uh, grow and, and relocate to a larger space. Uh, as I said, the, the building itself is depicted here. It's about 8,400 square feet in size uh, and will be located on, on towards the Route 9 portion of, of the lot. Um, and as you can see, the, the site is it's a corner lot. Technically, it's located at the corner of Route 9, Boston Turnpike, and Grafton Street. Um, so uh, the project itself, in terms of the just sort of high-level components, uh, include, in addition to this building, uh, there will be enhancements with respect to the parking. Obviously, uh, currently today, uh, the, the site is a, really a sea of surface parking. So in order to accommodate this building, uh, a number of parking spaces uh, will be reduced or will be eliminated in order to accommodate this building and the improvements. Um, as a result, uh, there will be, in total, uh, 476 parking spaces. So currently today, the entire shopping center, this shopping center, has uh, 565 parking spaces. So there will be quite a significant reduction rather than seeing a, just a sea of parking spaces. By the addition of this building, it will uh, add to the aesthetic appeal of the site. Uh, it will also break up uh, sort of the monotony of all of the parking, which currently is, is I'm sure, if, as people have seen, it's, it's quite underutilized. Uh, there's just far too many parking spaces there at the site now. So again, as a result of the project, there will be, there'll be 476 uh, parking spaces. In and around uh, the new building, in order to serve uh, pr principally the uh, Fidelity employees and their visitors, within 100 feet of the building, there will be about 100, feet, uh, 100 parking spaces. And just as an approximation, uh, there, there will be about 35 plus or minus employees at this, at this new building. Um, <clears throat> Uh, in addition, there'll be, as you can see here from this colored rendering, uh, there'll be some landscape improvements. Uh, so some uh, addition of trees uh, will be added, uh, as well as some low-lying vegetation that will uh, be, will, again, add to the curb appeal of this site. Uh, currently, uh, there's quite a bit of impervious surface, so there will be an increase, a net increase, with respect to the open space at the site. Um, in addition to that, there will be there will not be any new light structures as as um, there are enough light structures that are there today. Uh, however, there will of course there will be wall pack lights um, that will be affixed to the new building. Um, there, there's really going to not be any negative material impact with respect to this project in terms of uh, noise, light, traffic, um, in terms of traffic trip generation. Uh, it'll be de minimis. Um, again, with only 35 employees and uh, just limited number of visitors that are coming to and from this, this uh, proposed building and this Fidelity Investments building, um, uh, the trip analysis that was done uh, anticipated during the AM peak M period uh, a range between 15 to 19 uh, vehicles. So really uh, an insubstantial increase in terms of the trip generation as a result of this project. Uh, there will be no changes with respect to the curb cuts. Um, so there's access points uh, in various parts of this site. On this lot, currently, there's an access point at Grafton Street. That will remain in place. Uh, there is also an access point, a shared access point along Route 9, which shares with this, this shopping center and the adjoining shopping center. Lastly, there's a third access point um, off of Lake Street. So as you go down Route 9 heading west, uh, you take a right, you can, you can go onto Lake Street and also uh, come in through the other shopping center and then to this shopping center. Um, so none of those curb, none of those access points are being altered or modified as a part of this project. Uh, with that, I, as I said, um, we have some other representatives here who would like to say a few things with respect to the, a little bit more with respect to the architectural features of the project and, um, and the civil components. Good evening. Uh, for the record, Malcolm Basie with Polar Engineering. We're the civil engineers on the project. Um, I thought Josh did a great job of, of giving the general layout, so I'll just touch on a, on a couple of things. Um, as Josh noted, we, we laid it out at the, at the front of the, the parcel. We looked at it actually quite a few different ways when we were first laying it out. Um, we thought this way would be the way that would be aesthetically the best. It increases the landscape to Route 9 and kind of removes the parking along Route 9. We did look at putting an interior of the parking, and actually that was less efficient as far as parking removal, so this ended up working on a couple of different levels, one aesthetically, and then two, it didn't 
reduce the parking more than maybe we wanted to. Um, overall, the project increases landscape space by about 9,000 square feet relative to existing conditions. And along Route 9, along the, the building facade, it's about 35 feet additional um, landscape buffer to the right of way compared to the existing parking line, which is down right about where the proposed trees are now. Um, the project proposes ADA accessible parking spaces, ADA accessible route to, to the building, um, interior landscape spaces, and perimeter landscaping in accordance with the Schubert regulations for, for this particular project area, um, and stop control within the parking area to try to mitigate traffic that might be coming into use this development relative to the, to the greater parking area. Um, a fully screened trash enclosure with an, with an eight-foot fence is proposed to serve this building um, along with the existing landscaping along Grafton Street to help screen that. Um, we did prepare a, a stormwater analysis um, which was reviewed by the engineering department and the, the, the town's peer review engineer. The project reduces impervious area and landscapes place, so it's inherently reducing um, drainage coming off the site and an improvement relative to that. Um, utilities, water and sewer connections are available on site along with gas. Um, electric, we think, connect are immediately contiguous to the site right at the intersection of Grafton and Route 9. Um, as, as Josh noted, uh, we're removing one light pole and proposing just wall pack lights to light the sidewalk immediately contiguous to, to the to building. So overall, it's going to be a net reduction in lighting compared to existing conditions. Um, that said, I'd be happy to answer any questions um, if there's specific details, but it's the general overview. Um, I know that we've gotten additional um, renderings of what the, um, the elevations are, so right. I'm sure the public would be interested in, in yeah. seeing some of that. <laughs> So I'm Jesse with Dick and Sandal Architects in Worcester. Um, I think we did four renderings, one from each side, just to give you a vibe of what the building's going to be. Um, in, in theory, it's a one-story brick building, 18 feet to the, the, the drip edge, and then the front metal panel system goes to 22, the side ones go to 20. It's a pretty simple concept. Um, then there's large-ish expanse of glass, just like the unit they have now. We're not radically changing any of the Fidelity buildings in Boston. They use the same systems we're using as a very similar system here. So this is standing looking east in the parking lot. Um, you see, again, this is primarily a, a neutral facade, we'll call it. Uh, so their signage sits on brick in this case. And if we go to the next slide, you want to, I don't want to mess your computer up. I'm bad with computers. This is standing in the parking lot looking at the main entry. So here you see this is the, the biggest statement we make. It's a fidelity on a metal panel system, 22 feet tall, and the rest of the building's 18. Black drip edge and uh, a brick that they use around the state. And that's going eastbound on Route 9. So similar language, similar structure. And then if we go to the next one, we'll be, I think, going westbound. There we go, on, on Route 9 as well. So it's actually relatively... Fidelity hates me for this. It's relatively sheltered by the trees. So I think that's a good thing in the long run. Um, nonetheless, it's, it's not the visual impact. I don't think I'd be super worried about a massive visual impact on the site. Um, do you have any questions on that? I'm trying to keep it simple. I just wanted to make sure. Oh, yeah. Like I said, we've got a lot of material there. Maybe the public has any sure. No, sir. Okay. Yeah. So with that, we're, we're happy to answer any questions the, the Board of the Public may have. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I'll start with um, Mr. Jerry, do you have any questions or comments at this time? I don't at this time. Mr. Rodelakis? No, I, I don't either. There's plenty of parking there that can absorb this site. Mr. Thomas? Again, no, I, I think it's a great use for that site. I think it's a very bland site right now, and this definitely enhances the the look of it, so I don't have any questions or concerns about it at this time. Okay. Mr. Rao. I agree Mr. Thomas's comment with, with, that, with those comments. I think it's a very good use for that site right now. Right now, there's a lot of uh, parking there. Yeah, in, in terms of the site itself, I, I agree. This is this is an enhancement. It's, it's a very underutilized um, parking area, um, it, and it certainly will help kind of break that monotony up as you're driving down Route 9, and the, the building will be, I think, fairly small in scale, right? So it's not gonna overpower anything. So I'm, I'm fine with that. Um, question I have for Mr. McGoldrick though is, uh, what are we waiting for on um, anything from the town side? 
Uh, no, nothing more from the town side. So we do have um, peer review comments as well as planning provided some comments. Um, the vast majority of those have been uh, addressed and are included um, in the packets uh, from their responses. We do have one waiver request, which is um, addressing uh, one of the Graves comments for pavement thickness. Uh, that was received today. So we've also drafted a uh, draft decision for the board tonight, uh, if they so choose. Um, we would just look to have that waiver section included if the board went that way. Okay. All right. Um, this is a public. Is there any other questions from the board before I open? I have none. Okay. This is a public hearing. Is there anyone in the public that wishes to be heard? I see no hands. Did you? I, I didn't see the uh, draft decision. Did anybody? Uh, did you get a draft decision? No. Uh, you, don't, you didn't present the draft decision to us. Is this under review? Sorry. Uh, we have a draft decision. We did not uh, provide it to the board. Okay. But. So it looks like the, a draft decision is uh, being um, undertaken. At the, at the time, we don't have it. So um, at this time, we're not going to be able to go much further. Um, it, it seems to me, it, like you said, it's a fairly straightforward project. Um, and uh, as long as the items that are addressed at uh, Graves Engineering and any town staff came up with, I, I don't envision this thing being a big problem so um, I guess we'll entertain a motion to continue this public hearing um, sorry, hey, sorry. Just for, for my clarification uh, with respect to the draft decision one was per circulated to the board is that correct uh, no. it was not so I, I misspoke so we we have been drafting it internally I've not yet circulated it to the board okay. um, we'll send it off to, to you as well okay so um, not having done business in Shrewsbury for a while th this sounds similar to the way Grafton works. Uh, so the decision ha will be drafted. It will be circulated to the board. And at the next continued meeting, by that time, the board will have, the members will have had a chance to review it. And presumably, as, lo as long as all of the, everything is good to go, uh, the conditions and both sides agree, then a vote could theoretically take place at that time. Is well, that so correct? Then, this is like with approval, the operative board be approved with conditions. So Understood. I don't anticipate any issues. Okay, so there's no way that it could that the board could vote to approve, subject to staffs, it, 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 staff that, yeah, drafting not, the decision. That's not something that um, we've done in the past, and okay. um, quite frankly, I wouldn't be comfortable approving something I haven't read. So um, okay. <laughs> you're a lawyer; you wouldn't be either, right? <laughs> Understood. So in terms of the next, um, just timing-wise, the next meeting is what? When is that, Chris? Um, yeah, there is a possibility that there might be a special meeting um, maybe within a week um, that if that meeting does occur, we could certainly, if it's just a deliberation, that could be an option. Um, so I don't want to delay so, a client if there's a, a construction issue. So Are the excavator circling Grafton Street and Route 9? Is that what you're telling me? Uh, their, their time is definitely of the essence, okay. yeah. for sure. So why don't we, uh, well, if we do this to, to next week, then we're going to absolutely have to have another one next week, right? I don't see how we're going to escape it either way. Right. I, again, where this is such a straightforward one, and normally we would have a draft decision, um, but unfortunately we just didn't have the time to have it done yet. Sure. Um, so I guess we can entertain a motion to continue to next week then. I move that we continue the uh, public hearing on the proposed office building and site plan improvements, site uh, plan modifications, Shrewsbury Crossing, uh, Roman numeral number two, LLC, 571 Boston Turnpike, until Thursday, uh, 13. Uh, April 13th at 7 p.m. Uh, do I have a second? Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Okay. So we should have that completed by that. Okay. Thank you very much. You're welcome. All right. Our next item of business is a continued public hearing for a proposed two-family conversion special permit, Tasha Hayden, location 7 Ira Avenue.
Good evening, Mr. Chairman, Good members evening. of the board. I'm here to answer some questions, I believe, from last time we met uh, last uh, last meeting. Uh, there wasn't enough to have a vote, I guess. Right, I think we were waiting for department um, items to be addressed. Yep, so there's still um, the question of the utilities um, and being separated. That was the comment from um, water and sewer. And, and we, we responded to that a week ago, saying that it was acknowledged, we understand, and it's been budgeted in the, in the plan, in our, the financials. Yeah, we'll still need uh, revised plans to show that that oh, changed. I didn't, that, did, that feedback didn't come back to me, so I... Uh, My apologies. I guess we had a disconnect there. So you need, you need the site plan with the utility showing on it? Correct, yeah, the revised okay. site plan showing the separate so utilities. Understood. All right. All right, so, um, so unfortunately we weren't going to be able to go forward based on the fact that we don't have Understood. a site plan. So. Um, so we postponed it until we get those plans in your hands. Right, so um, I'm going to guess it, it's going to take a little bit of time to redo those. So mm -hmm. uh, why don't we entertain a motion? To, oh, actually, before I go further. This is a public hearing. Is there anyone in the public that wishes to be heard on this matter first? Seeing no hands. Um, I'll entertain a motion to continue the public hearing to the May, I would think. Yep. I move to continue the public hearing on the uh, special permit for 7 Ira Avenue until Thursday, <coughs> May 4th at 7 p.m. Do I have a second? Second. All in favor? Bye. Aye. 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 Sorry about the miscommunication. Thank you. Thank you, folks. Have a good night. Thank you. Okay. Our next item of business is a continued public hearing. Mr. Rodelakis will be recusing himself from it's for a proposed warehouse and distribution facility site plan approval. Shoes me land property owner LLC, 440 Hartford Turnpike. Um, I did receive a request um, for. Uh, continuance again they are still working out some issues um, does anybody have any questions or com comments relative to the request for continuance I have no no questions yet. okay um, I have no request uh, no questions either so I'll entertain a motion to continue this public hearing I move that we continue the proposed warehouse and distribution facility site plan approval for shoes land property owner LLC 440 Hartford Turnpike to our May 4th 2023 meeting at 7 p.m. Do I have a second? Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Thank you. Okay. That brings us to our next public hearing. It is a continued public hearing for 1 to 7 Maple Avenue, Beale Commons, site plan approval and special permit, Shrewsbury Haskell, MM, LLC. Location is 1 to 7 Maple Avenue. If the applicant can please introduce themselves and give us... Thank you. Thank you. Oh, thank you. <coughs> Mike check. Mike check. Can everyone hear okay? Okay, seems to be okay. Thank Hi, my name is Taylor Bearden, partner at Civico Development. Uh, I'm here with uh, James Murphy, Esquire, and Eric De Brule from Bowler Engineering. Uh, thank you for having us again this evening. I would like to uh, run through a number of items. On March 28th, uh, we submitted an updated set of plans to the board. Uh, for the 1 through 7 Maple Avenue project uh, proposed at the former uh, Beale School. And uh, those plans are, are the hard lining of the conceptual plans that over the last couple of meetings this board has seen. So most of the conversation that we have had has, is contained in those updates. Uh, Eric is here should the board at a later time in this presentation like Eric to run through uh, the plans in their entirety. So the majority of changes that we made that are reflected between the last uh, discussion we had with this board and now are a further reduction in the Haskell Street wing um, for a total of about 90 feet from the original presentation that we had shared with you in November. 
uh, a total unit reduction of uh, two for a residential unit count of 53 from uh, 55 which were proposed previously and uh, the net reduction in the average square footage of the units uh, by the introduction of studio units so taking some two bedroom and one bedroom and changing those units to studios to overall reduce the building footprint and overall reduce the number of bedrooms. Our belief is that uh, that results in fewer occupants with cars and overall shrinks the massing and is consistent with the requests of this board previously to reduce the overall scale of the project. So if you'll please move to the third slide, I'll walk through the elevation slide, yeah. So, so this visual uh, shows you the 90 foot reduction, which is about 40%, uh, which reduces the visual impact on Haskell Street significantly. Uh, we've also reduced or removed the gables since the facade is shorter. So overall, we have simplified that design. And that red outline represents the extent of the original uh, Haskell Street wing and as compared to the current elevation that we have proposed. Next slide. So this uh, flips to the rear of the building facing the parking lot. I'll bring your attention to the image in the lower left corner specifically because we've uh, simplified the roof line, but we've also removed those garden level units on that side. So you may remember that previously we had uh, full three three sets, three height, uh, three stories on the uh, parking lot side, whereas now uh, we've eliminated those. So the residential units uh, on the Haskell Street wing on the ground floor are only facing Haskell Street. Next slide, please. So in this uh, site layout plan, um, this just gives another visual to show the extent of the reduction along Haskell Street from an aerial view. So you can see that at the last meeting, we had proposed uh, what we were referring to as land banked parking. That has uh, now been eliminated, although the board had reacted favorably at the time, uh, to accommodate 146 spaces uh, without any compact spaces. So the changes maintained the overall number of parking spaces while reducing the net number of bedrooms, overall massing, and overall footprint of the building, and eliminated any proposal for compact spaces. Next slide, please. So this image is also a uh, plan view, and if you look to the right of uh, the screen, you'll see a green box that is calling out an additional 19-foot wide strip over the full extent of the parcel uh, that we are contemplating and proposing to add to the retained parcel. So the retained parcel that would be uh, deeded back to the town at the completion of the project would be another approximately 3,800 square feet. And what accommodated this change is, as you'll note there in the drive aisle, uh, there is no longer parking on both sides. So we were able to relocate that strip of parking that would have been fronting on the retained parcel and moved it over into the newly created uh, area where formerly there was a building footprint on the Haskell Street wing. Next slide, please. This uh, image also just represents, uh, the board had specifically requested we identify locations for snow storage, so we've called out a number of those on the plan. Again, uh, if it is the board's desire, Eric from Bowler Engineering can run through the plan in more detail, and uh, we'll cover this uh, with the print copy um, that's up on the stand. So a couple other items just to share, the do not, blocks, uh, do not block the box markings have been added at the Haskell and Maple. Uh, those are of course subject to mass DOT approval, but uh, we are committed to advocating for our position, making the argument to mass DOT during the process that those would uh, result in a net positive for the overall project. Next slide, please. So this slide just represents the numerical changes uh, that I just covered in the previous slide. So we're looking generally at a uh, fairly significant reduction in building footprint. I'll give you some percentages on the next slide. Uh, overall shrinkage of footprint, uh, gross floor area, as well as lot coverage. Um, our landscaped open space increased uh, nominally to 39% from 38. 
Um, we uh, had to reduce, or we weren't able to gain more, partly due to the fact that we uh, had to accommodate um, the full-size parking spaces and, and couldn't increase that buffer. Uh, the unit mix, as you can see, so that table there shows that we've added 14 studios uh, by taking away both one and two bedrooms for a net reduction uh, in bedrooms from 75 to 64. And uh, the retention, of course, of the 146 uh, parking spaces. I should just mention that uh, the unit mix changes were a result of the nine two bedrooms were eliminated and seven one bedrooms. Uh, so there was actually a majority of two bedrooms that were eliminated with that change. <coughs> Next slide, please. So in aggregate terms, uh, the building footprint was reduced by about 20%. Uh, the floor area by 24%, of course, because there are multiple floors. So that's obviously a larger reduction than just the building footprint. 15% reduction uh, in bedrooms because of that elimination of some of those twos and ones. And uh, this resulted in a uh, peak parking demand of uh, 12 fewer spaces. And this was validated by MDM's peer review. Next slide, please. So uh, we have uh, had a number of, of meetings subsequently with both Graves Engineering and MDM as I mentioned, uh, in discussion with MDM, we've agreed to a do not block the box strategy. Um, we also are in agreement to the suggestion of a no left turn signage at the driveway exit um, for during the peak weekday hours. Uh, per our discussion with MDM, uh, we are not recommending uh, signal recoordination because it would simply shift the burden to another part of, of the town and doesn't result in a net positive for the overall area. And uh, our proposed on-site parking supply now exceeds what our uh, shared parking study um, calculates as uh, necessary for this commercial and residential mix by about 41 spaces. So those 41 spaces are now effectively buffer spaces, uh, and that's inclusive of those on Haskell Street. So eliminating uh, the, the public parking on Haskell Street, the buffer in the actual surface lot itself uh, is 31 spaces uh, based on our study. Site plan review comments from, uh, from Graves Engineering. All requested plan updates have been made. I should mention to the board that, as I understand it, at 3 o'clock uh, there was a resolution that may not have made its way to the board um, on that final Graves Engineering comment. Um, but I think, I don't know if, if uh, Mr. McGoldrick wants to making comment on that but okay so no, we're that's fine and we have graves here as yeah. well um, so uh next slide please so as i as i've said if you're uh if the board requests it uh, we can run through the plan uh, the civil plan uh, but i also would just like to mention that in in the aggregate it's our perspective now that uh, we've through working with the board and public comment in addition to the select board and town staff we feel we've been very responsive to the input from uh, various stakeholders, and that's resulted in this iterative outcome that you see now. Um, I would request that, uh, consistent with your usual practice, um, in whatever way that, that may be, that we kind of follow your lead to walk through uh, any questions you may have from the updates tonight, but also uh, conditions of approval that you may see uh, or have questions on. And we're here, we have our council here, and uh, traffic and engineering to answer any questions you may have. So with that, I'd, we're here for, here for feedback and comments. Thank you. Um, I guess I'll open it for the board. Does um, anybody require additional um, information relative to the site plan um, for the changes that have happened from the, from the uh, engineering staff? Um, Specific to all the changes here, like the smaller <coughs> building and I'd like our peer reviewer to confirm the, the traffic, Mr. Michaud, to confirm the okay. acceptability of the uh, parking and the uh, circulation. In it. Okay. That well, was Mr. Michaud, you happen to be here, so if you could please give us an update. Thank you, uh, Chair and Board Members, for the record, Robert Michaud of MDM Transportation Consultants. So we've issued a, 
uh, supplemental review letter stated to the fifth. Uh, <clears throat> it's based on the revised site plan layout. Um, many of the recommendations that we've identified through ongoing discussions with the proponent and departments have been incorporated in that plan set. Um, so we have no further comment on that. Um, we did receive uh, some supplemental comment from the fire department that had to do with swept path analysis relative to the fire apparatus. Um, supplemental exhibit has been produced by the proponent uh, and confirms that there's adequate maneuvering area for various um, portions of the site for that particular purpose. So we concur that uh, the current site plan meets all of the applicable standards of care, uh, recommendations, and safety, uh, particularly from the fire perspective. On the uh, parking issue, um, you know, we, we did a, another deep dive, if you will, on the parking because we knew that was a central concern um, uh, that we identified early on as well. The reduction in bedroom count and the net reduction in commercial space and building area uh, cumulatively have reduced the parking demands associated with the project. In particular, during weekday evening and midday period, uh, weekday midday periods when uh, residential parking demand tends to be coincident with uh, potential commercial uses on the property, restaurants in particular, we were focused on that period as uh, the critical time. Uh, and the combination of demand site-wide is now substantially reduced from where it had been uh, by at least uh, between 12 and 14 vehicles. Um, <clears throat> and we acknowledge the presence of the 10 additional public spaces along Haskell Street as augmenting that uh, overall supply. So looking at um, parking holistically, uh, we are really looking at 156 parking spaces, some of which would be inclined to uh, support downtown businesses. Um, and potentially on-site uses. So the 10 Haskell uh, Street spaces, for instance, may have some utility in serving a cafe use as a practical matter, uh, in addition to the on-site parking. Or during a, uh, a lunchtime period, uh, there may be some portions of the site uh, that support Shrewsbury Pizzeria or, you know, Amici's, et cetera. So we looked at that from various angles, and uh, we concur that the sur so-called surplus or buffer of parking um, is, is probably in the 20 to 30 space range, which is adequate from our perspective to accommodate the surge, occasional surge in demand that you'd find uh, if there's a, you know, uh, uh, an, an occasion or event where you might have higher level of downtown demand, uh, higher level of cafe use, or a higher level of, of residential demand than, than typical, right? That combination of peaking uh, is now accommodated with a buffer of between 20 and 30 parking spaces, which we think is appropriate. So we're comfortable with the parking scenario. Um, as it relates to um, some of the other recommendations which are now uh, formulated and committed to by the applicant, the do not block the box markings are intended really to serve as a relief valve of, <coughs> of sorts for those folks who would be inclined to go to Maple Avenue that may periodically you know, be in inhibited by a cue from the signal. That happens from time to time. We think that's appropriate and has shown to be an effective solution in other areas of town. Um, the no left turn restriction on weekdays during peak hours we think makes sense uh, was an outcome of conversation with the proponent and town departments, including public works, engineering. Uh, we think it can be a, an effective deterrent, if you will, for folks to avoid the local neighborhood streets during those particular periods when local neighborhood streets are a little more sensitive to cut through traffic. Um, so the combination of the, the markings on Maple Avenue and that restriction we think is appropriate um, in the context of the project. Finally, uh, as it relates to signal coordination, um, you know, we'd very much like to see coordination happen, but the applicant um, has prepared an analysis which we've reviewed that would show, <coughs> show trade-offs. Um, and those trade-offs would really uh, perhaps <coughs> shift the burden of queuing from Main Street and, and the east-west connections to the north-south connections. And uh, the unintended consequence of that might be a shift in traffic to avoid the signal in the north-south connections, uh, which really serves no purpose, right? So it's uh, net some zero game here. 
um, the relative impact of the project from a traffic perspective, and I'm talking about new traffic, uh, represents a small percentage of the overall traffic in the downtown area. And so <clears throat> our position would be and our recommendation would be that um, this project does not independently trigger the need to do drastic measures downtown. There are pre-existing issues for sure. Uh, we think that the types of mitigation that are being committed to are appropriate in the context of the impact of the project. Uh, we think that they're reasonable and we don't believe that there are additional means or measures that need to be applied in the downtown area as a function of this project at this time. So that's it in a nutshell and I, I'm glad to do a deeper dive if you have specific questions on it. Thank you. <coughs> Any, okay, so I'll go around the board. Um, I'm not sure if you're voting on this one yet, but Mr. Iliad, do you have any questions or comments relative to the changes? No. Mr. Jerry. I just, I just had a couple. Um, by changing the unit mix, how does that impact your financial projections? And I would assume that the, the individuals you would presume would rent a studio apartment are different than a one or two bedroom. And so when you're projecting the financial impact of this project, how does that change in mix impact those numbers? Are you asking the financial impact to our performer or financial impact to the town? The town. So from a just kind of high level, I think the only material change in the reduction in bedrooms is an increase in the likelihood or a decrease in the likelihood that there would be school-aged children because we're reducing two bedroom and one bedrooms and turning those into studios. <clears throat> Otherwise, it's not a material impact to our expectation for tax revenue or uh, meal tax generated in the commercial, for example. Okay. The second question I had was just with respect to the elevations you showed. It came up at a prior meeting um, and I went back and reread the architectural design standards and there is a note in there that for large-scale buildings that there be dormers to break up the roof line every 30 feet it seems as those have still not been incorporated on this so I'd welcome comment from anyone else on the team but I'll give a, a cursory answer to that which is that on the on the Maple Street elevation uh, that's that's just a little bit over 30 feet there yeah. of uninterrupted roof span and uh, so the introduction of a dormer there considering that there's there's ample examples in other New England town centers of uh, roof lines that are not broken up by dormers. Uh, the introduction of a, a fake dormer there uh, seems unnecessary based on our interpretation of the architectural peer review. Uh, the Haskell Street side uh, is longer, it's about 60 feet. Um, but if we were to introduce a single dormer, for example, to break that up, it might look a little arbitrary. Right. Um, so although I understand the, the the intent of mm. the bylaw, obviously, the uh, the other variable here is, you know, designing a building consistent with New England, you know, traditional New England town centers that's aesthetically appealing. And so in, in this case, the uh, adherence to the bylaw just uh, strictly based on the design of this building, I think would appear slightly arbitrary. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Mr. Rodelakis. No, I'm glad that uh, the applicant uh, has reduced the amount of bedrooms because for me the big issue was uh, parking you know I, I thought that the area could handle the traffic um, the parking uh, was going to be the big issue on site and the applicant didn't have uh, a really good answer at the first couple hearings about parking you know you know with respect to controls that, that you thought it could implement but uh, in light of the fact that Mr. Michaud has confirmed that uh, the pa parking meets the applicable uh, standards and uh, the interior circulation appears to work, um, I, I, I'm happy with that. I'm also happy with the fact that uh, the applicant brought the size of the uh, project down in terms of the square footage, the floor area. And it just doesn't seem to, uh, when you look at an aerial view, it doesn't seem to as much overwhelm the site. So those are my comments. Thank you. Mr. Rao. Uh, I echo comments of uh, my colleagues here, board members. Uh, you have 
uh, reduced both the building floor area and uh, bedrooms were significantly. Uh, in terms of the count of the units themselves, it's not uh, as much, but I'm sure there are some financial reasons from your side to not go down on those. Um, it's, it's a decision for, for you, you know, but uh, um, certainly uh, it has come down and uh, parking um, would help at this uh, level. And um, I think um, it, it's definitely a better project. Now, so. Mr. Thomas. <coughs> Excuse me, I have a question about the, um, the parking space buffer we were speaking of earlier. So I know when you reduced the building the first time, that was going to be green space and then possibly um, parking space is needed. And then now that you've reduced it more, is that continue to be green? I don't remember looking at the plan. It's going to be parking so the the way that we're contemplating it now is there is no there is no proposed land bank option and the the geographic area where previously we had proposed land bank spaces which would have been green in the near term uh, that is now parking okay it's so current parking proposed as to be built with the project not land banked for future use it's good okay then it's good that you gave back more of the green space from the from the park um, for that I do appreciate the fact of you listening to me and the rest of the board about the massing and the, uh, and the not so much the unit count, but the bedroom reduction. I think the, the studios are a good idea. It definitely makes it better. Um, and cutting down in two bedrooms definitely makes it better because I know a lot of the concern is about children, school-age children and stuff, and I think that would help in reducing that, or at least a possibility of reducing that, which I think is a good thing. So as of right now, I'm, I'm good with that. And um, I have no more comments right now. And uh, I, I'll echo the comments. Um, thank you for you know having the ears open and listening to both the board and the public's comments to scale this back to I think is a much more manageable um, application of the site and what the vision of the town center is is looking to be. Um, question I have, uh, and you didn't mention it, but I believe this is true, with the reconfiguration of the parking area. So the the reason why the belt went the bank parking is no longer is we've gotten rid of the compact spaces so we kept the 146 but we lost <coughs> the parking so that was a f element of it i understand that but there's also you're pre-planning for 23 electric charging stations is that true uh, so we're planning for two ev charging spaces spaces to be built currently one of which would be accessible at the knuckle the interior knuckle of right. the parking area and then 20 percent ev ready in addition to that okay so very good. So yeah. there is going to be some EV ready um, situation that's going to be. Yeah, that represents 30. So 30 EV ready spaces, two EV spaces to be built at construction. Okay. One of those built EV spaces to be accessible. Very good. Thank you. And in terms of the no left turn hours, have you, um, or Mr. Michaud, have you, have you discussed what, what, what are we looking at in terms of for the signage for the, for the residents? I would defer, I think, to uh, Maureen or Mr. Michaud. Good evening. Maureen McHugh from McMahon Associates. Uh, I believe we had discussed the typical uh, morning and afternoon peak hours, seven, generally 7 to 9 a.m. and 4 to 6 p.m. 7 to 9 and 4 to 6? Yeah. Thank you. Very good. Thank you. I just want a clarification on that. Thank you. Um, as I said, I, 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 I am... Um, so I'm of the understanding now that the dormers are definitely something that, even though it's part of the, the design standards, it's, it's something that you feel is arbitrary in this particular case? Correct, in this particular case. Not, not calling into question the, the intent of the bylaw, but I think that we are, uh, we are producing a, a traditional contextual building that just based on the specific span for these, these two wings of the building, uh, to meet that would, would, would appear visually slightly disharmonious and, and uh, arbitrary, but it also, they would be false, false dormers to begin with. So it would be a, an architectural uh, feature only, not, not functional. Okay. And all I would do is add that the, the board does have the power, as you probably know, uh, if there's a deviation from a shall in the design standards that you can incorporate it as part of the special permit. Understood. I, I, I know that we have guidelines and they're typically guidelines to help address some things and and i understood so i'll take that into consideration okay um thank you so i know any other questions any questions from the town staff 
Nothing further. Okay, this is a public hearing. Is there anyone in the public that wishes to be heard on this matter? Yep. Yes, sir. Please come down and introduce yourself, <coughs> your name and address. How are you? My name is Pete Yablonski. I'm representing 16 Chase Terrace um, regarding a few things that we had discussed several weeks ago. Um, they, I applaud the developer. They answered several of our concerns, I think, with some great leaps and bounds. They pulled the setback back a few feet. They um, dealt with the retaining wall and some grading issues, provided privacy fencing, um, and put in, they were proposing 15 uh, green giant um, screening trees along the border. I think all of that's well and good. Um, but again, there's a couple of details I think I would like some confirmation on. Um, number one, the, the trees that the landscape architect specifies, they call out a six to eight. That's not how they're purchased. It's a, it's a, it's a minor detail, but if we're gonna plant trees that are this big and we have a wall that's this big, it, it really doesn't satisfy screening for 12, 15 years. So, you know, there's some concerns there. Um, in addition to that, one of the main things that we had talked about before was, you know, coming up with some sort of understanding of what they're going to do along the border in terms of tree removal. So there's a couple of trees on there, and there's a in the landscape architectural plan and, the, and Bowler's plan where Bowler requests, you know, to be removed basically the entire tree line, everything that's on either on the property line or, you know, before it to be removed. So some sort of clarification as to what you guys are doing to the canopy along that border, I think is kind of critical because the landscape architectural plan shows one of those main trees that's of concern to my client that, I mean, truthfully, the way it's set up right now and the way it's designed, it can probably stay. It's just a matter of when the PM's in there and calls in the tree guys, we need to understand, you know, what are they going to do? Okay. Yeah. Response? Yeah. Do, you, do you happen to have, I well, think I, do. I have a, I have a hard that copy? It? Yes. Yeah. So I think uh, one of the comments was about the, uh, the canopy being removed. So I'm thinking maybe on our demolition plan, it probably showed it to be removed, it's but I don't think that necessarily maybe was the intent. Are these the three trees? Is, are those? That's that's correct. So, is, have you seen this current plan? I don't. I did. I did. One. I looked okay. at that. Yeah. So, uh, I guess bring the board up to speed. Effectively, um, the landscape architect is showing 15 ar arborvitae or green, I think green giant arborvitae planted at six to eight feet, I believe, uh, six to eight feet. And then speaking with her before the spacing. Um, she thought it was important for the spacing to allow the trees to grow to maturity. Um, and if the trees get any tighter, the, the root area wouldn't have, uh, there's less success uh, if you clump them close now. So she was comfortable with, with what is being proposed. I know you mentioned. I, I, I think the, the spacing is correct. The spacing sure. is fine, okay. Um, it's, it's about the specification on the actual size of implementation of tree Right, so at the I time this question is, so is where that, you know, what you know, height would yeah, you be out, installing out of the at the street, outset? We've got three and four inch caliper trees. It's fantastic. I think that's great for Main Street. I think, you, you know, those oaks will look great. Um, but in terms of privacy, um, again, you know, for a client that's aging, they, they're not going to see any return out of anything that's planted there. You know, it's... It, seeing something that, that creates more privacy than just the fence line would be great, but that's just our comment. Okay. Okay. So the, <clears throat> the trees staying, I would be some clarification. Yeah, so on the trees. So back, back to the tree removal. Right. I, I, so the three trees that are much larger caliper to the top right of the plan, those are the existing trees. I think that the landscape architect believes can remain based on the retaining wall. Um, 
Are you suggesting other more trees being taken? No, out? no I, I think that's fantastic. But the landscape architectural plan, when it comes time for implementation and when if and when this project does move forward, will be about somebody looking at the demo plan and saying to be removed. And the tree guy comes through and clears everything and he says, well, that's what was on the plan. Do so we have a demo plan? maybe we should. I want to take a peek at the demo plan because I think I think maybe what you're getting at might be just a clerical error on our plan. It could be easily. Can this be something addressed in a pre-construction meeting? Yeah, it absolutely. I, absolutely, it, it's just it's something that needs to be said publicly and needs yep. to be brought With some to attention. And you can yeah. tie it to yeah. the tree. I think so. That's we it. we hear the concern and are consistent with the landscape plan as shown. Those trees that. Uh, the speakers referencing are intended to stay and so whatever is necessary to convey that in in any subsequent communication we will agree to that okay so mr mcgall could right. take that down as a condition just to ensure that it's in the in the, whatever decision is drafted thank Great. you thank you thank you guys is there anyone else in the audience who wishes to be heard yes ma'am hi uh rebecca mealy uh, i live on birch lane I have two questions. First is um, the um, no left-hand turn from four to six. As a parent of a previous uh, middle schooler, that uh, Maple Ave is a, kind of a mess between 2.30 and 3.30. So I think that you might want to think about increasing that time. Um, it's a difficult road to navigate. Just so that we're clear, the left turn only is exiting the site, not not a left turn, no left turn on Maple Ave. That's not what's proposed. Never, it's never going to be a left turn onto Maple Ave. No, no, the le the no left turn between the specified hours is for exiting the site. Yep, the entrance that's what I'm talking site. about. Okay, as long as we're on the same. Exit, <laughs> exit out of, onto Main Street. Onto Haskell Street. Onto Haskell Street. Correct. Yeah. So, so we're going to have no gonna, left hand turn no, onto so Haskell Street. On Haskell Street, correct. Okay. Okay. I that wasn't clear to me. So that's why Thank I you. wanted to make sure. Thank okay. you. Okay. And then the other one is um, commercial space. Didn't hear anything talking about commercial space tonight. So I think the last meeting we had talked about potentially reducing commercial space. Um, maybe removing that from the first floor or I'm getting a little confused because there was a lot talked about at the last meeting. So if we could talk a little bit about the commercial space, please. Please. So I can just give a, a quick summary on, on what we're expecting. So we, uh, at the, with the last proposal, we had reduced the commercial to 7,000 square feet. And there were no subsequent changes between what we discussed last time and what has been presented here. So our intention is to maintain that 7,000 square feet of commercial uh, fronting on Maple. Thank you. I think what you're under, those, those were comments that the, uh, the audience was uh, suggesting of ways to manage to further reduce the footprint, and those were just concept ideas. They weren't necessarily brought up by the applicant. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Is there anyone else in the audience who wishes to be heard? Yes, sir. <coughs> Mr. Hale. Good evening. Um, I'm Michael Hale. I've lived in this, I live on Wesleyan Terrace. And I've lived in this neighborhood for more than 25 years. I think it's worth stating that while I grew up on a dead end on the last house, my wife and I bought our house because we like being in an area with a lot of activity going on. We like the action. Uh, we thrive in that setting. When this project was first proposed, I was somewhat skeptical about it. But the more I've studied it, the more I've became a strong advocate for it. Um, let me start by saying, though, that in the previous hearings, there's been some of the critics of the project have expressed concern that this isn't Hudson, this isn't downtown Concord, and I couldn't be in further agreement with them in that. This isn't Hudson, and it isn't Concord. Our commercial, those are their commercial districts in their respective communities. Our commercial district clearly is in the Route 9 area. That said, in West Concord and in West Acton, there are small village districts that exist, and those small village districts have small businesses, restaurants, bakeries, and that's what we, my wife and I, envision for the town center, a reimagination of the town center 
to bring more commercial activity into town that will support the 1,400 plus people who have the ability to walk and enjoy that. So that's our primary uh, interest in this. Um, you know, I think some of the buildings in the town center are going through facelifts as we speak. You see it at the Daniels building, the Daniels insurance building, the new owners are really putting a nice fresh coat of paint on it. They've taken down a lot of the scrub brush bushes and it, it, it's starting to look very nice. I think you'll see something similar next door at the all, old Walgreens building. And the woman who recently purchased 524 Main Street, the old grayish brown brick building, she intends, and she's putting a new facelift on that building opposite Westward Road. Um, she intends to put a holistic wellness center in there. I'm told she has a very successful business over by the Greendale YMCA, and we would welcome that type of business in our downtown district. And so I think this project comes at a good time because it's coming at the coattails of these projects and it dovetails nicely into the revitalization of what we refer to as our small little village district in the center. I think I support the project because I want to create a neighborhood that I can walk to places of community congregation. Right now I can already walk to my primary care physician, my dermatologist, my dentist, all those professional services I can walk to, but there aren't places for the community to go to and congregate and sit down and enjoy a nice conversation. And that project provides great opportunity to get us there. Um, if I had my way, would I want less housing units? I believe the answer is probably yes. But I also understand in the last two major developments in this town, significant housing components were needed to make the projects economically viable. And I speak to the outstanding work of Grossman Development at the Lakeway Commons project, as well as the new market basket that all the residents of the area are starting to enjoy. As for the parking, to the layperson like myself, it seems a bit tight. However, when you stop and spend some time in the center, you come to realize if you walk that, there is a lot of parking in the center. It's just not at the doorsteps of the businesses that people visit. So people are going to need to adapt and they may have to walk a bit from where they park their car to get to their destination. It's not like we're building a grocery store here where every spot needs to be right and you're carrying out hundreds of pounds of bundles that you can't take very far with you. That's not the case with this development. Second on the parking concern, and the timing of this is perfect in a way, is that in Monday's Wall Street Journal, I don't know if any of you read it, but there was an article, a great article titled, America Has Too Much Parking, Really? And so the gist of the article was the communities across the country are rethinking parking requirements as paved lots and parking garages are partially empty. Younger populations seek alternative means of transportation rather than the typical two-car household. And many people are working from home. You know, and lastly, you know, this project is going to generate, in all likelihood, more traffic on my street, Wesleyan Terrace, which is a bypass to avoid the Maple Ave Main Street intersection. And my wife and I have talked about this, but willing to accept that as a trade-off in exchange for, and we're putting a lot of um, trust in the developers of this project that they will fill the, the retail space with places of, where the community can engage and enjoy a conversation and bring people together rather than divide the community. So that's my Thank you. Thank you. Is there anyone else in the audience who wishes to be heard? Yes, ma'am. <clears throat> Good evening. My name is Julie Holstrom. I am a resident here in town. Um, I've lived here for about seven years and I've worked in economic development in the Central Mass area for a little over 15 years. So I'm very familiar with this type of development and um, I've had the opportunity. I'm familiar with um, this with Civico's um, proposal here 
and I believe that this is a group that is seems to be committed to um, the vision that the town has put forward in the the town center study that was done with all of us having the ability to put input into. Um, I think that they've taken that into account and really put together a very thoughtful, very forward thinking and very creative proposal um, that really helps to activate um, our town center. Uh, right now, I think, don't get me wrong, we have an absolutely beautiful town center, but there are no amenities. There's no allure to bring people down to that town center to actually enjoy it. You know, the ideal town center um, or downtown center is exactly what Mr. Hale said. It's a, it's a park once, stop twice, or maybe more. Right now, we don't have that. And um, I think, you know, this particular project does bring some, some significant density to the area, which I, I think is not a bad thing. Density is often looked at in, uh, has a, sometimes a negative connotation. Um, but I think in this context, it's just the opposite. Um, we have the ability to attract new shops, new restaurants, new amenities for these people, for the residents and for the visitors that are coming to our town. We should be welcoming that. Um, so as I was thinking about that, as you're welcoming it, it's, it's creating that sense of community. It's creating that more vibrant, active neighborhood that, that Mr. Hale uh, referenced. I think about, as an example, the, the Yuletide um, marketplace that um, we've had in the town center for the past couple of years. And my family and I love walking around down there. It is energetic. It is just bustling. And it makes you feel like you're really part of a community. You see everybody out there. Um, but that's for one day. We have an opportunity here to have that that type of bustle, that type of energy on an everyday basis. Um, and not only just creating that everyday energy, we also need to look at the economics of this in terms of this is creating new jobs for the area, new tax revenue for our community. Those are all good things. And I, I, I really truly hope that this, this board um, takes into in, all of that into account and uh, looks to approve this. So, thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Is there anyone else? Yes, ma'am. Hello. I'm Lisa Bartone, 702 Main Street, and I, too, am a proponent of this project, like the last two speakers. Um, I'll try not to repeat everything that they said, but add one thing that they didn't mention. Um, just to give you a little bit of background, to understand my experience in projects like this. I've been on the Shrewsbury Development Corporation for the last 15 years, and that's an economic development organization in Shrewsbury. I've also been on the zoning board for the past 12 years, so I'm uh, used to supporting development like this while also protecting our abutters. So this has been a very interesting project. Um, we had a lot of uh, critics of the project at the last hearing, so I wanted to make sure you heard a different uh, viewpoint. I'm also a abutter of the town center district. So I do, I live at 702 Main Street. I am not a direct abutter of this property, so I really feel for the abutters, direct abutters. So please make sure you include those conditions that benefit them. <coughs> Um, but I do walk to the center of town nearly every day, and I, uh, like the last speaker, I enjoy the Yuletide event. I do know that um, a vibrant town center is going to have an impact on me. Uh, my life is going to change. It's going to make it really hard to get out of Bruce Avenue. It's already hard. But I'm a proponent of uh, vibrant town centers, which have a trickle-down effect. In my experience with the Shrewsbury Development Corporation, I researched the impact, the positive impact, that vibrant town centers can have to the entire town and municipality, not just in the area of that town center district, but it's going to encourage other development that we have highlighted in our master plan. It makes Shrewsbury a very 
uh, attractive place for the right types of businesses that we want in other areas of Shrewsbury. So I'm, uh, again, a proponent, and I hope that you'll approve with conditions. Thank you. Thank you. Is there anyone else? Yes, sir. Oh, the, <coughs> no, with the tie, yeah. If you wore a tie, you'd be next. I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm, just, I'm just teasing. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Uh, my name is Dan Goodykans. Uh, my family and I live at 33 Colton Lane, uh, near the town center. And I first want to thank the planning board for all of your, your work. Uh, you spend a lot of time throughout the year serving the community, and I appreciate all the volunteer hours uh, for everything that you're doing. Um, I rise to tell you that I'm very excited about this project, and my family shares that enthusiasm. Um, First of all, I, I think it's important to point out that I appreciate what has been a thorough, comprehensive, transparent, and a reflective process, too, by, by your, uh, the, the partners of Civico and, and the planning board. Um, the Shrewsbury Town Center study, this project reflects what's in this study, and the community said this is where we want to go. Uh, so I think for that reason, it's important to um, uh, move forward. I. I also think that, uh, you know, I know sometimes, depending on a project, we might say, it's okay somewhere else, but not in my backyard. I want you to know, I want this in my backyard. Um, I'm through the town center every single day, going to work and, and coming back. So I know what traffic is like. And I know over the years, the 20 plus years that we've lived on Colton Lane, that uh, Maple Avenue and Main Street, it's, I hate to say the word deteriorated, but it's not something you're proud of. Businesses are abandoned. They are weed strewn. We can do better. This project is not the only project, but this project can be a catalyst to show that we can do better, just as some of the other things that have been mentioned by, by my neighbors um, and the other amenities and, and uh, opportunities that can happen. So from my perspective, my family's perspective, the town center has languished for far too long. It's been neglected. The town center study, the select board, our town manager, and others are beginning to pick it up and revitalize it. And this is the project that we need to get going on. I hope you can improve the conditions. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Sir, with the blue jacket, yes. <laughs> uh, my name is Danny Cobb. I'm at 12 Redcoat Road. Uh, Long-time listener, first-time caller. So um, uh, first of all, I'd like to thank you for all you guys do. Uh, your patience and persistence through all of this, your uh, uh, ability to move things forward, keep things calm, keep things on target is uh, uh, admirable. So thank you very much for that. And I'll attempt to do my part to help you out uh, as, as you do that. Um, I'd also like to say that uh, to start off, you can be a huge fan of a park once walkable center of cultural, civic, social, economic vibrancy. I got all the buzzwords in there, I think I did. Um, and still not be in favor of this particular project. Um, I, I echo most of the sentiments that some previous speakers said when they talked about wanting activity downtown, wanting, wanting uh, 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 more business and services downtown, wanting, wanting those sorts of things. Uh, I've been here 38 years seems like just yesterday and uh, uh, since those days I used to sit at the center dairy bar on Saturday mornings and have lunch I haven't had the opportunity to do that you know what's it's been 30 35 years something like that so look look forward to an opportunity to do that um, Mr. Gutekinds referred to the uh, town center plan I spent a lot of time in that plan uh, a lot of time in the town center vision uh, uh, report a lot of time in the master plan. And I just have a couple of notes uh, uh, that I'd like to read. Mm -hmm. I also have a couple of, of comments that I might save for later because people gave them to me knowing I was coming tonight there at Holy Thursday services so they couldn't come. So if if you end up with a little time at the end, I'd love the opportunity to, to come back. So thank you. Um, so the master plan, which I think uh, is one of the uh, consistency with is one of the, the biggest criteria that uh, that you use for granting the special permitting uh, 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 granting authority uh, says uh, you know support the town center as a focal point for bringing community together through social economic and civic activities great I think 
that has been consistent. I went all the way back to 2013, some of the inputs into the 2016 document and beyond. That has been a consistent theme throughout. All of the, the benefits that we're talking about have been consistent themes throughout. The question is, does, is this the best option for the town to accomplish those things? And for a number of reasons, I don't feel that it is. Um, uh, there's no mention in those documents with regards to developing the town center um, for dense housing. And by virtually any definition I can find, this is a pretty dense housing proposal. Uh, I tried to do the math on the latest documents that were uploaded. I think we're at 88% residential versus 12% commercial on a square footage basis or, or something like that. Um, that's, that's a stretch to call that even mixed use, um, uh, where the expectations set forth in these documents talk about uh, commercial on the first floor, uh, maybe one floor of, of uh, residential above, okay, Two, if you're, you know, if you make it make it fit in with the right dormers and things like that, which maybe gets you to 66% residential, you know, two two thirds residential, um, still doesn't, you know, do, doesn't accomplish that. The residential drives the overhead and the drag on parking, on traffic, and all the things that nobody wants, but we're willing to tolerate if we get the things that we do want. Problem is, with 7,000 square foot of commercial, we aren't getting the things that we want there. This proposal has gone from 20,000 square foot of commercial down to seven in the time that it's been alive in town. And um, uh, it's, it's just not going in, a, in, in the right direction. Um, the uh, town center vision as an extension to the uh, master plan says that uh, uh, generally speaking, retail, office, service, restaurant use would be the focus for the ground floors. Importantly, as discussed earlier in the report, uh, we, the market for residential use is very strong in Shrewsbury. Some level of residential development will likely be needed to support the viability of, uh, of commercial use within this district. I think we get that. Some allowance, I highlight allowance, uh, for top of shop housing will also be included in the zoning amendments. So with the backdrop of all this, my question is, how do we interpret what some allowance means? I think if you went back to the people in 2013, you went back to the people who sat in the libraries and drew on the whiteboards and put post-it notes up and things like that, and you told them that the answer to the question that they were asking was 53 apartments and 126 private, not public, parking places, they would be astonished. So, thank you. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. I saw another, yes ma'am. Hi, Carol McWilliams, uh, 28 Colton Lane. I just um, I appreciate the accommodations that are being made, um, but I point of clarification, last meeting, didn't the board ask that they um, adjust two things, retail as well as residential? We've talked about residential, but I thought you, put, you petitioned them, to, uh, the developers, to have more retail I, because it I, had been reduced. That was my understanding. Right. I, I could have been Going wrong. Going by our memory, I think, at least for myself, and I believe for some of the other board members, there were we, several were, people. we, we were um, disappointed that the amount of retail was right. reduced, but we did not specifically say that we would want that to be back. I know I personally did not. I, I did think those were the two points, and so I said you've addressed one, and uh, as we talk about making it an active and thriving downtown, 7,000 square feet for retail or commercial, I'm not sure that's going to bring enough, and we don't even know what the businesses are going to be yet. I mean, we're all hoping for a coffee shop. We all want that. Yeah. I wish there was some way that you could verify that that was going to happen, because that would make a big difference. People want to meet in town like we used to. Yeah, Because that town is growing that. in every way yeah. except yeah. socially. I, I don't know. Understood. I understood. Yes, please. Can I make a sure. I empathize a lot with that comment about the importance of, of who ends up in this retail. Mm -hmm. And what I shared at a previous meeting, and I'm just going to reshare it in case you weren't here, is that we as developer and long-term owner of this proposed project, we have a very aligned uh, goal with you for creating a vibrant place where people would want to belong. Because we, if we are going to rent this and it's going to be economically viable for us, 
then those people that will live there will also be neighborhood residents. Just like anyone who may be looking at this now thinking, you know, how can this space improve my quality of life, create gathering places, our incentive is to do that, not to put some <coughs> dead use in the ground floor that will make it less desirable for the people who will reside there and will support the economics of the project. Well, I guess my hope is as this progresses and things become more definitive, that then someone will be out there making sure that those are the kinds of um, people that will, will take the, the uh, retail space. I, you know, it seems to me that that could almost be confirmed before this is all over. Yeah, un unfortunately, I've found over the last 10 or so years, um, the ability to identify tenants for retail has waned dramatically. Typically, it's the build that they will come philosophy is, is how it's kind of materialized. It's, it's well, so just so. the way that it is. I'm sorry. But, but so the retail is OK. You're satisfied with the 7,000 square feet. I'm, I'm more satisfied with this plan than I was with the last plan, personally. I've, yes, ma'am. Yep, with the purple. I think it's purple or blue. <clears throat> Hi, Karen. Um, Kolovnia, 19 Wesleyan Street. Um, I'm just opposite the project. Um, and thanks to everybody for everything, including your adjustments and uh, doing such a good job with keeping it moving along, like everybody says. Um, I just want to make sure that everybody understands that some people speaking sort of against the project are not necessarily against it in its entirety, as you indicated. I think we're concerned, and several, of the, you know, some of the neighbors I certainly know. Um, I guess it's just such a big project. We're very concerned with the size, and I appreciate the slight adjustments. I think a lot of us were very excited when you had all said, maybe fewer units next time would be really great. And we were, uh, I think, feeling very good about that. I don't think it's necessarily the, 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 uh, the business space we're so worried about. I think it's the, the living space, as everybody's been saying. So, I think that's all I have to say. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <coughs> Thought I saw another hand over that way. Yes, yes, ma'am. My name is Paula McCarthy. I live on Wesleyan Street. I moved to Shrewsbury in 1954 and lived on Francis Ave when it was an unpaved dead end road. Had a lot of good stuff happen in this town over the years. Road got paved, sewers came in, they broke through the cow pasture, built that beautiful neighborhood down there. This project, though, scares me. And when I look at what our objective is to create the meet and greet and the festive atmosphere, and we need the commercial balance to be a little bit heftier than the residential balance. And when it was pointed out at our last meeting that it cost the town so much more to support residential properties than it does to support commercial properties. I thought, well, this is a great way to blend this, to tip it a little bit, to cut back maybe a little bit more on the residents and get us more commercial going on. I was chef at Amici Chattaria for four years. I'm very familiar with what happens on Main Street and how the businesses are affected. And having that little space to tuck in and people stroll over to Amici to dine, that would be awesome. If we could have more spaces like that in this project for people to stroll over to dine, that would be great. So maybe we could look at a little bit more on the commercial side and a little bit less on the residential side, and then maybe it would be less scary for us old Shrewsbury people. <laughs> thank you. Understood, thank you. Uh, we have any hands on this side of the room? Looking for hands. Yes, sir. I'd just like to echo that you guys do a great job. As a chairman, you know, I mean, we couldn't ask for more. And um, every time I've, I've seen you handle a hearing, which isn't that often, because usually I'm not that interested, but um, <laughs> <laughs> I'm always pro-development. And I think the neighbors uh, right next door have the concerns, and you seem to work it out all the time. Um, but not necessarily for this project, as I've mentioned in the past. Um, and there's, there were a lot of small reasons, but there's also some, some pretty deep reasons. 
And part of that starts with the old Beale School. Um, you know, we always talk about the historic nature of the downtown and, um, you know, keeping that as we're knocking down these buildings that are 50, 75, 100 years old. How do we ever get a building to be 150, 200 years old if we keep knocking down these buildings around this age? It's not going to happen. So future generations are not going to be able to have the culture that we have today. That's disappointing. Many towns accomplish revitalization of their school buildings. They've done it in Auburn. In, in this area, they've done it in Auburn, in Milford. Um, I actually uh, own a condominium in a complex that has a school that was built in the late 1800s, added on in the early 1900s, renovated in um, 1984. It's in the best shape it's been at this very moment, and I expect it to be there a long time. And there are beautiful condos and apartments in that building. So I'm disappointed that our um, representatives didn't push more to have that happen. If that had happened, I would be more accepting of a higher residential count. I think that would have been a fair exchange. Um, so that's a starting point. But with it as proposed, there are a few negatives here that I would like to bring up. First, I have a question about the uh, parking. In uh, prior meetings, it was mentioned that there would be managed parking. Are we still looking to have managed parking? Response. So in previous meetings, if I recall correctly, we have indicated that the uh, property manager, and this was feedback from a, a local resident who owns a property management company who has managed uh, similar scale buildings for us included in the past, uh, is that we could propose to have residents have a sticker system so that the on-site uh, staff would know the circulation of residents and commercial employees by virtue of a uh, sticker in their vehicle. And that way they could get a sense over time of the use of the parking space and then deploy a, an enforcement mechanism if necessary. The feedback that we got from uh, Madison Management, it's the man management company I referenced, uh, was that it's each one of these has a, a different dynamic. Each building has a different culture around who uses it and how. And uh, she was very resistant to propose a, uh, a very strict protocol up front until there was an opportunity to see how, it, uh, how the residents and the commercial, uh, commercial employees kind of played out. So, so that obviously brings concern. Anytime there's even speak of any type of uh, active management of parking, we all know that that's not a good situation. I think some of the members have mentioned that in any way, shape, or form, whether it's the owner performing it or a management company, um, it's never, it's already speaking of problems. So I worry about that. Another issue with the parking that I think is a major downgrade to our center is the proximity of parking for the rest of the center. So we have currently um, with the Beale parking area, parking right on Maple Ave, right next to the sidewalk. The new proposed public parking area is as far away as you could possibly get from that. And we all know that people want convenient car parking. I heard, you know, I hear comments about well, people will have to change their behavior, but that's not how it works. I'll, I'll ask for clarification, but I believe that that dedicated parking has been correct. So there, uh, the agreement that we have for the acquisition of this land requires 20 public parking spaces but there's no dedicated area that is proposed as public only because of the limitations around assuming who is in fact a member of the public when they are potentially both visiting a, uh, a commercial or a, a patron of one of the commercial spaces you cannot in fact say they're not members of the public so because of that, and based on the feedback, our interpretation as to how to manage that was to eliminate the carve out for specific public parking and instead just focus on ensuring that the peer reviewer as well as our traffic study was uh, represented that the parking we were providing was uh, adequate to support the proposed uses. And so that's, a, that's actually a concern because any time that we're not, we're going from ideal to less ideal, um, especially when you, you look at your mandate, which I look at, anybody here could end up being in your position. So I always look at this as I'm in your shoes and I'm looking at the strict criteria. Um, and it's actually pretty, well, 
uh, play on words, it's pretty significant, it actually says significant improvements. That's a huge bar to get over. Improvement's a huge bar, never mind significant improvement. So I don't see how we moving parking farther away for that town center area can be considered an improvement, never mind a significant improvement. Right now it is dedicated um, public parking, even though the signs were taken down, taken down recently. Um, obviously it hasn't been improved because of a possibility of a project. But that's just, a major concern. Just to be clear, that's a condition of the town center zoning bylaw to put the parking in the back. Mm -hmm. I, I understand that, but it's you know it's way in the back. It's there is parking up in that area. It's just not for <coughs> public use. The public use parking is staged to be in the back. That's my that's my point. It's the proximity of the parking that is the issue. And there is parking near Maple Ave, but it's not. Um, set up to be that way. That's that's my concern. Sure. Just want to make sure that everyone's clear. This entire parking area is public parking available. Whether the space is open or not Correct. is the challenge, right? So Correct. There is parking that is closer to the Maple Ave area, down one end of where the site is, that could potentially be open that is just the same space that it is today. I understand. And it's a perception. And you will make that judgment according to this criteria, if that is a significant improvement or yep. not. So Understood. that's, you know, that's something that you have to decide. Um, another issue, just, just with the amount of parking spaces, um, I know that this gentleman had mentioned it in one of the prior meetings, and we've downsized slightly, which is great. The, the change of um, bedrooms is good when it comes to the cost analysis on school children. Um, but just a little anecdotal uh, analysis that I've done without trying. I was at a 122 diner in Holden. They have um, their own parking area, plenty of spaces, nine o'clock on two Sunday mornings, a month apart. I actually counted the cars because they had significant extra parking and I used to be in that business, so I was curious. So there were um, 60 cars at 9 a.m. one week and 64 the next time that I visited that location. 2,500 square feet very plausible out of a uh, 7,000 square feet, you could end up with something like that. That's, that's the real world. And I, you know, if we're choosing what we want to do with this prime spot, I think that we should go for, you know, the ultimate situation, not a, oh, maybe it's going to work, maybe it's not going to work. So I think, I mean, that, that's kind of your job, but um, I don't know if you're familiar with that diner um, through the chair, um, the 122 diner, but that's a... I'm not. Easy enough thing to see. Okay. Um, I just want to go back one last time to the future. Um, so planning board, uh, anytime you do a project, you're thinking of a future. To me, the future is at least 25, 30 years down the line. We've had people in the past in Shrewsbury that have purchased that land that we're now going to be expanding on for our cemetery. 50 years ago, close to 50 years ago, they were thinking of the future. What is that downtown going to look like 25 or 30, 40 years from now? Um, I think I saw in the traffic report that there's an estimated 7%, 1% per year, 7% increase in the downtown traffic without this project just from the area growing through the chair. Is that correct? I believe that is. Mr. Michel, could you confirm that? Uh, uh, yes. <coughs> the um, growth trends that were used in the study 1% annually for seven years, right? That's a standard now. If you look at the actual growth patterns for traffic, particularly during peak hours, it's less than that. So this is, this is a level of conservancy, uh, conservative um, assumption that's applied there. Um, if you look at um, this vehicle growth uh, on one metric and then there's housing growth on another, uh, population growth on another, they don't necessarily all correlate one-to-one, -one, um, particularly when we look at traffic during particular hours of the day, peak hours. Peak hours tend to grow at a slower rate. You know, so, so yes, you are correct. That's what the assumption was used in the, in the traffic study, but we believe it to be a conservative assumption. Thank you. So, you know, with that being conservative, and I know that, you know, if the area fills up, perhaps that percentage will go down slightly but we're still looking 20, 25 years mm -hmm. out. So that 7% could become something in the neighborhood of 20% busier. That's quite a bit busier, and I only bring that up because we do have a historic downtown 
center. And residents have mentioned, you know, the village concept and all of that. It's always been the issue with Shrewsbury. There are no other roads in that area. There's no ability to put in a bypass like many downtown areas have done um, around the country. And even in our area, Marlboro has done that in the past. So we don't have that ability. And it's always been an issue in this town. And it's going to be a greater issue. We know it's going to be greater. There's development going on in Worcester Sand and Gravel in the future. There's only one way to get east and west and north and south in that little area. And so that's a huge concern that I think that you should consider. With this special permit being nine units or more, I just don't see where the unit count of that special permit qualifies. Commercial is fine, some residential is fine, but asking for more than the nine units, I don't think passes this criteria. I really truly don't see that. And with all of the hurdles that we're going to face down the line, which is what we should be planning for, I think we really have to seriously consider this and not just take the tomorrow to go over and have a cup of coffee, but look at the long-term future of Shrewsbury. So thank you for considering that. Thank you. <clears throat> Is there anyone else in the audience that wishes to be heard? Yes, ma'am. Hi, Mindy. Hello there. Mindy McKenzie, 40 Colton Lane. It's the first time I've said that. I just wanted to say this is the first meeting I've been able to attend, and I just want to say that uh, in, I'm in agreement with a lot of the folks. Thank you very much for discerning a, a very good product, and I think there's been a lot of great discussion. I fully support this project. Uh, I moved to Colton Lane with the intention of being able to walk downtown because I know very well that my kids will take away my keys from my car one of these days and I'll only be able to walk places. <laughs> I want to have some place to go. Uh, there's, I've spoken with a lot of my younger uh, neighbors. And they're all in uh, a few families just in the last few days and uh, to asking about this project and most of them have kids in strollers and they also want to have some place to walk. I think the younger generation doesn't look at parking as being an issue. They look at walkability as being an issue. And I look at this project as being one for the future. So thank you very much. Thank you. Yes. Forty three the blank road. Um, I grew up here. I have lived here my entire life. I grew up with, with the vibrant um, center. We had, um, oh my gosh, I can't even think of what it was called, at the Center Dairy Bar. We used to go there on Saturday mornings. Everything was filled at the town center when I was young. We had places to go. We had the pizzeria, the Center Dairy Bar. We had Hail Drug. We actually had places to go when I was young. Um, it would be fantastic if we could get back to that. Um, I have stood in front of this board many times fighting against these projects, and I applaud um, this developer for lowering the apartment com um, count and bringing it to one bedroom. That's going to be huge. Um, I have fought every single time for school kids. I actually sat in front of the apartments and counted how many kids got off of school buses. And I stood in front of these guys and fought them <laughs> because of it. So I applaud you for doing that. That's, that's a big thing for me. Um, also, I go to Market Basket at least twice a week, mm -hmm. sorry. And the traffic there isn't what I expected it to be. Um, so between that and I live near Lakeway Commons, so going back and forth between both of those, I'm happy to say that I am not finding the traffic to be what I expected it to be. So I'm hoping that this project also, that the traffic isn't realized what people are expecting it to be, although the center is vastly different um, from what those two projects, you know, it's a different area. So with the changes, I mean, I was excited for this project anyway, but with the different um, apartment counts, I'm very much excited for this project. I'm hoping that maybe the counts can come down just a little bit more, but I'm excited for it. So I support it. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. LeBeau, I almost didn't recognize you. I didn't recognize you. 
<laughs> We've changed over I know, a little bit, huh? <laughs> uh, good evening, members of the board. My name is John LeBeau. I live at 203 Walnut Street. Um, as a previous speaker mentioned, this proposal, this project has been almost 10 years since the master planning process since began, and there was talk about the center. Then it became much more focused with uh, various committees that were more dedicated to the center or for the Beale reuse. Or, and each of them had multiple opportunities for public comment. And as uh, Mr. McGoldrick's predecessor, Mr. Cahill, said at a Board of Selectmen's meeting last year, he was impressed with how many people came and participated at those early planning uh, sessions, uh, many times more than 50 people attended. Over that period of time, a plan, the idea of a plan was created. But before anything could happen, before anything could happen, <laughs> Um, the board had to go outside itself. The board can't just come forward and say, we want to do this. The board had to go to the town meeting, went to the August 2020 town meeting, and had to ask five questions to the town meeting. And the town meeting needed to agree to every one of those questions so we could be sitting here tonight. So I'm sure the board recalls, but I'm going to take advantage of the moment just to remind folks that what was voted on that night, and I'm not going to go over every single article, but I am going to say the disposition article, the motion was for the purpose of making the property available for sale for no less than one dollar and to authorize the Board of Selectmen to enter into any agreements and to do all things necessary to dispose of said property by sale upon such terms and conditions as the Board of Selectmen deemed to be due in the best interest of the town. That question was put before the town meeting. Elected people, not appointed by the Board of Selectmen, there's a finance committee that acts as essentially the Ways and Means Committee for the uh, town meeting. Again, appointed by the town moderator, does not answer to the Board of Selectmen, unanimously um, recommended that article. That article passed by a two-thirds vote. There were four zoning articles, which also required the uh, finance committee to review, all unanimously um, recommended. Your board though an appointment of the executive branch of the manager, your board also had to consider those four zoning articles. Unanimous recommendations of the planning board. And I do want to call out in article 34, I believe, excuse me, 33, which established new language talking about what a town center district is. It begins, number one, the purpose of the town center district is to A, Foster the development of a traditional New England village center that features a vibrant mix of civic, commercial, institutional, residential, and open space uses within close proximity to each other to create attractive, walkable neighborhoods where people can live, shop, eat, conduct business, and enjoy arts and cultural activities. So that's why we're here tonight. That allowed the board then to move forward to put out an RFP. We got run, the board got one response. That happens in all kinds of uh, government procurements. Always the desire is that there's multiple responses. Frequently there is only one, and frequently that one is awarded because it meets the criteria that was established in the RFP. So I want to make sure people understand that a broad base of this community supported the concept. The board went forward and created an RFP, a legally correct document. A responder responded properly. The board decided to award the contract to begin this process. I may not have all my terminology um, appropriate. But that's why, we're, that's why we're talking about this. And that's why it shows that there's a broad base of support for this project. A previous speaker also mentioned and I think you were a little uh, kind that 35 years ago the center was doing pretty well. Boy, I don't know. I, I, was, I had written in my notes, I was going to say, I, I'm afraid to say that in my memory it was 50 to 60 years ago when we had a vibrant center. You're a lot older than I. Yeah, so I am. <laughs> but I didn't think it was that vibrant 35 years ago. Um, it was a vibrant center. It is no longer a vibrant center. What's going to happen if we do nothing? What has the past 20, 30 years showed us? A steady decline, 
some people really fighting the good fight and fighting it well, but they could use some help by having some other activities around them. So just in conclusion, I simply want to say that I think people want a vibrant town center again. And housing seems to be, we've, we're learning, is a vital component for any kind of redevelopment. We've heard tonight, and I guess you've heard as you've gone through this process, that the developer has listened, has listened to you, has listened to the community, has adjusted accordingly. So I simply ask that you please support the revitalization of Shrewsbury Center. Thank you very much. Thank you. Sorry, hand up that way. Yes, sir. Peter Mont, 278 Prospect Street. So we all want a walkable downtown, but the idea that this one building is gonna make it a walkable downtown and we're gonna be in Boston is, is just a dream. It's just not a reality, folks. We have a highway going through our town center one. Times have changed. I believe, yes, it was great 50 years ago, but that's not coming back. You know, there were no malls 50 years ago. Route 9 didn't look the way it looked now. There was no Northborough Crossing. So I think with this development, what's going to happen is we take all the downside. Again, the developer gets to privatize their profits, and we get to socialize the losses and the potential risk. It is not going to change our downtown. We're going to have more empty storefronts. That's what's going to happen. This is not the answer to our problem. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Is there anyone else that wishes to be heard? <coughs> Yes, ma'am. Hi, my name is Megan Gormley. I live at 41 Knowlton Avenue. I, um, I've been attending a couple of these and I have to say it's really interesting. I, I hadn't experienced this whole process, so you guys have worked really hard, both sides. Thank you very much. I do have some questions just for clarity, so I appreciate everybody's opinion, but I would like a little couple more details, if that's okay. I hope that I'm not over, like, repeating some questions, because I know we don't like to do that. So um, I am seeing that the Haskell Street side now has 10 parking spaces, and I believe that's a new thing. That's not that, new. That was from the, from the get-go. Okay, from the get-go. And is that going to just be the overnight parking requirement, like no overnight parking allowed? or uh, Mr. McGoldrick. Uh, yes, I believe that uh, the overnight parking restriction would remain in this case. That's a, a factor of um, town by law not uh, pertinent. To this. Okay, I wanted to confirm that. And then I know a long time ago we had the low income housing aspect and it was 13%. Is, is that the number? 12 and a half, I believe. 12 and a half. Okay, and that does not change with the number of the studios and all of that? That number remains? To confirm we continue to offer 12.5% of 53. Lovely, thank you, okay. And then I guess this is a general question that I don't understand on the bylaw, you know, about the town is, is there any aspects to support some sort of green, you know, initiatives when the building is being built, like LEED certified or anything like that? Are there aspects to that that we, because to me, environment is important, right? I love my recycle all the time, right? I just want to hear what the plan I, I'll is. I'll let the applicant answer yeah. first, yeah. So, this gets fairly complicated. I'll try to summarize to the best of my ability. Uh, Thank you. The, the building codes are presently being updated at the state level right now. Okay. And Shrewsbury is what's called a stretch code community, which was enacted by virtue of, I think, a, a vote in 2008 in Shrewsbury to become a, what's called a green community, which is a designation by the state. And what the stretch code allows us in the Commonwealth of Massachusetts is to meet higher energy standards than the base code, which, okay. is, uh, which, which would have been an option for Shrewsbury had it not opted into the stretch code. So those updates that are happening beginning kind of on a rolling basis, July 1 of 2023 through July 1 of the following year are becoming much more stringent. And therefore the delta between what, uh, what might be familiar to listeners as like lead certification, the delta between that and the basic code requirements has been shrinking over the years because the state is uh, trying to meet decarbonization goals that at the state level and at, at cities and towns are obligated to do so. So we have not yet determined exactly, we haven't specified, for example, you know, the heating and mechanical systems in this building, but I will say that by the time that there's a building permit, 
uh, we will be subject to the updates to the stretch code, which are significantly more uh, rigorous than have been in the past. Wonderful. I appreciate that update. I just hadn't heard it, so no. I didn't know those pieces. And then the walking part that I wanted to clarify, I, I'm really happy, by the way, that you added more green and it's going, so thank you for that. It's, take any green we can get, and I like the trees that are staying and the new um, pieces you have that are coming, but my question is the walking, is the path for people to walk to the front is basically just down Haskell, right? Unless they walk through the parking? I believe, if my memory serves me, the there'll be a pedestrian entrance from Maple Avenue okay. at the, I want to call it the west side. I don't know my, my directions. Yeah, maybe just off. zoom out so we can see that. Because I want clarity. Is it up? Oh, okay. So there'll be pedestrian access up there through to the back of the site versus having to walk away around the whole Great. Thing. Okay. I just wanted to make sure that there was the path there. Because yep. if we want everybody to be walking, and we have to be able yes, to do that. Absolutely. Okay. Very good. Um, and then there's a bike. This is a silly question, but like there's a places for people to put bike storage if we have people coming in to purchase and not just parking cars. Yeah. I'll let the applicant answer that. So there are places for bike storage and... Great. That's all I need to know. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. Appreciate Thank you. It. Very good questions. Thank you. Is there any other questions from the audience? Yes, ma'am. I said I was going to say cool, sir. I forgot to do that. <laughs> um, Julie Ross, 18 Haskell Street. Um, I'll try to be short and, and direct. I have a few leftovers from the last time. I know we're running out of time, so I promised to postpone a few things. So administratively, um, will we have an opportunity to submit written comments if we have them um, beyond when I assume this is the last meeting? I should say that first, right? Uh, not necessarily. So the uh opportunity to submit written comments that would be included in the public record um, is uh, the entirety of when the public hearing is open. When the board closes the public hearing, you can still submit um, public comments or written comments, but they will not be allowed to be included in the public record, and the board will not be able to consider them. So um, okay. this entire time. That's uh, all right. That's why I'm asking the question. <clears throat> yep. So the deadline is irrelevant. So that wipes that right off the list. <laughs> Uh, there was a couple of um, other little questions that I had about the process. Will the evaluation, when, when you're all done with your deliberations, will that be made public at all? Or will that be something that's always kind of kept? I, I believe you asked me that, uh, what do I use for my calculus? No, well, I was asking you what that way um, was, and, and but I, I'm just wondering if there's any more general evaluation or anything that would be. In the 11 years I've been on this board, I've never once had to quantify what elements of any particular part of a site okay. overweight another. To me, all of it goes in right. to a single stew, and you know, some have a higher level of importance in one particular site, may not necessarily be in another particular site. Yeah. So it's, it's a conglomeration of everything that we have for available information. Okay. You know, I ask that, again, not to belabor things, but the years I worked for the state, we had to justify every decision we made and why. So in my mind, my baggage that I bring is I'm looking for that because I had to participate in my section of three or four RFRs, we called them, but the same thing. So I kind of want to, that's um, automatic pilot I'm on, I guess. I keep wanting to find that. And But, you know, that's what I need to know. That's why I'm asking the questions. In earlier um, meetings that we've had, we've talked about certain issues about parking and one thing or another and how we are all foreseeing with our crystal balls uh, what's going to be a problem and not. And a few things have come up where we would just talk to the police and ask them to come fix things. I'm wondering if anybody has actually done any outreach to the police to see if they have any authority to go on private property and or um, is there, I, did anybody do anything with that? Mr. And that's going to be a walk into the, something else I asked earlier. Do you want to explain the uh, yeah, we, department we, comments? Yes. Um, so we've been in contact with the police department. Um, they've reviewed the submittal um, and had the opportunity to submit any additional comments. Um, in terms of the access to private property, that would fall within their normal police powers. Which, in my experience, has been for minor things, what they would consider to be minor, like idling cars and or parking where you're not supposed to be parked, they don't have the resources to really do that. 
So I'm just kind of wondering if, um, you know, it is what it is. So I'm not asking you to defend it or not. I'm just kind of knowing what no, to expect. But, but the police I'm, department I in this particular here. case did and have an opportunity. You are putting this right in my face, yes. you know? So it's not like I can just turn around because I'm just going to, this is, I'm, I have to live with this. No, I understood. Um, so, yeah. Um, all right. So it's um, kind of in that mindset of enforcement and all about the planning board itself. And I've tried through all of my comments to stay really within the site plan with everything I've said, respecting you know what your jurisdiction is and trying very hard to do that. Um, but beyond your initial checkoff, when you say you have to have, for example, two or three electric vehicle charging stations. Um, so the building inspector, somebody comes by when it's all done and checks it off, okay, it's there. Over time, how long does that continue? My, my thought, just a quick example, is somebody forgets to unplug their EV and they drive away with the nozzle, you know. I say nozzle because I saw once a guy driving down the road with his SUV and the nozzle was in the car and the hose was flopping mm -hmm. in the wind. I'll, I'll let the applicant <laughs> it could happen. answer that, but um, I believe the management company is responsible for everything that's on their okay, side. Okay, so if you had any funding from the state or whatever for that, then that would become another issue for other auditing that when you, you know, if you applied for and got grants, that all the okay, whole different infrastructure, whole different thing. When they close out the site and the construction is completed, they're going to be required to file an as built plan which shows that everything that was proposed was built in, in, in accordance with the specs and, and everything is where done. it is. And my understanding is they actually at times go down and count shrubs and plantings yeah, yeah. and everything. At the beginning, else. yep. Yep. So when construction is completed, that will occur. But, but with respect to certain things like the, what's underground, there's, the, there's going to be an operation and uh, maintenance plan that it's going to have to be followed. And they're going to be required to submit, I, I think, reports to the town engineering department that, in fact, that has been done, that has been complied with. Okay. And in most of these projects, what's going on beneath the pavement uh, is as critical as what's going on above the pavement. Oh, I know. Like I this. know. Um, my neighbor here many years ago used to have a lot of runoff from the, the current ball field go directly into their front yard and into their cellar. So, yeah, I know that matters. So that's why I'm asking kind of the question about what happens more in the long term here. Um, just a couple of the um, little things here, and, and I promise to go away. Um, this, um, the, the, I looked, I, I, I looked um, more at the um, architectural review and I was delighted to see a little bit more than what I did the last time I looked and thank you for that. Um, there, there were some things there, but I guess I have one, a couple of definitions that I want to talk about. One is what, how are you define, she was a chair, how are you defining um, New England architecture? And it's such a broad, thing, um, New England architecture. Okay, so I will admit, I'm an architecture buff, big time. Um, it was one in, in, in planning school, it was one of my favorite things, you know, the urban design and all that. I will readily admit. So I think this is very subjective, but I'll, I'll do it my sure best is. to articulate <laughs> as it relates to this project. I think using this as an example, I, from a materiality perspective, uh, you know, the horizontal clapboards, the uh, sort of human scale of the massing, where when you're walking, you know, along the street, it has a very clearly articulated kind of base, middle, and top. Mm -hmm. It's, I, I think human scale is probably one of the, the features of a traditional town center. Um, in the case of, of this project in particular, uh, it, it feels very kind of residential in, uh, in its appearance, even though it's a multifamily building. So it would not fit in, for example, in a downtown. So I think by, by virtue of that, it kind of defines itself, at least in, in, in our communities in New England, as a very traditional town center building. Yeah, thank you. I, you know, one of the things I was impressed with was your sight lines. I mean, when I tried to visual, visualize myself there, which is not hard for me to do because, like I said, I live there, 
Um, I could I could kind of visualize where my eyes would be, where it's going to rest comfortably, and it really seemed to not be too overwhelming. I mean, I really kind of liked that. Um, but there are other parts of it that I thought were kind of meh. You know, it just kind of looks like any other shopping 500 unit complex apartment complex here, there, and everywhere. Um, some of the designs that were, I think, the West Acton project that you did, they were very nice. I thought that was very much New England, -y, but some of the other ones just looked like it could be Ohio, you know, anywhere. I mean, certainly not New England, which is why I wanted to ask the question. But I know you really tried, so I want to give credit where credit is due. You know, it is what it is. So, you know, um, the scale is more important than I think the actual style, because you're right, that's very subjective. Another kind of subjective thing and looking for definition, and I, I have to bring this up because it, this has really been troubling with me, troubling me as a block the block box thing. And I had mentioned last time we were here, I think in some cases we're talking past each other. To someone with a commercial driver's license, block the box is something that came right out of New York City. And it also entails um, traffic um, cameras that are set up bureaucrats that review traffic cameras um, or traffic pictures and issue um, citations to drivers for going through red lights and whatnots. Um, I know a bus driver who in fact because of somebody parking beyond the stop line in the street um, had to do the pull up back up pull up back up what's on your site plan in fact for the trash trucks what they're going to have to do to kind of get turned around and get out of the parking lot and it started, when he started it was green, when he finished it it was red, he got a ticket, it would have cost him $200 to go to New York City to fight a $100 ticket. What I had asked for originally at the hearing um, in December 2021 about a sign for don't block the intersection, uh, what I was envisioning was a little sign that basically there's one in Kenilworth, which is right before Lake Street on the southbound side of 140, just reminds people don't block the intersection. So um, can I interrupt you for a moment? I just want to finish with yeah, one sentence ahead. that all we are asking for is the little sign, not the whole legislative brouhaha. So and my understanding is this is going to be brought to Mass DOT to see, Mass DOT may not approve that block the box. I hope not. I, I'm just telling you, it's that'll it's, tie it's, this up it's for a, 20 it's years. A it's a recommendation that MassDOT will make the final decision, and by by quite frankly, they could have come and just done it by themselves, anyways. I would like to politely suggest you remove the jargon of block the box, and use what it is we're asking for. If we can agree here that all we're asking for is a sign that reminds people to not block the intersection, because if I'm thinking as someone with a CDL. That, that means the whole brouhaha of tickets and one thing or another versus just a simple little sign that we have all over town already. DOT is maybe more likely to interpret this whole New York City thing and, and what block the, and it sounds good, block the block, block the box, but it really has a whole set of baggage with it that is way beyond Understood. what I think. We'll take that into consideration. Yeah, please be careful <coughs> of your jargon because it does mean different things to different people. Um, I, I really think that's important because otherwise it'll just never happen. Um, the last thing that I want to say here is that I've been, I've tried to be respectful, as I've said, and to, to stay within the site plan. So I haven't really kind of um, said much beyond that. I, from a personal point of view, I want to applaud the town, and I've been to some of the early meetings at the, um, the library and all about, you know, redoing the whole town center. In fact, I dug out those notes from a meeting back in 2019 that I went to at the library and one thing or another. I love, absolutely support the idea of developing the commercial center again. I really think it needs to be done. I, when I read all of that through all the time when I was able to participate, what I saw, and we all read things that interpret in our own way, I saw open space as having equal standing with everything else. And I was shocked. I mean, when we, were, when we first saw the, the, some of the early responses that there would be 65 units put in the backyard and 0.3 acres of land. Shocked. Um, you know, it, it's come down. We've got a little bit more of a park. Um, but I, I, when I was trying, when that first came around, I was trying to envision 20 units would be a lot. And I know that the RF, 
had said, you know, nine units or above. So I was envisioning, okay, double, that would be 20, and even that would be tough in there. But I was envisioning that the town had put equal value on preserving the open space that's in the center of town. Great parks make great places. We're trying to, re, you know, re renovate the whole town center uh, commercially, and I think that having a great little park down there, preserving much of what we already have there now, which would be a little bit more than just the 0.7 acres, would really benefit the town. I know that's not what the developers want to hear, but you know, when I was younger, I thought by the time I was retired, I'd be making a million bucks a year. It didn't happen. It was a great idea, but it didn't happen. We all have, you know, and, and when you say if we don't get enough return on our investment, the, the, the first thing that pops up in my head, well, if you only build half as many, you're not going to have so much of an expense. So it's not going to cost you so much. And, you know, it might not be as much money in your pocket at the end, but, you know, it's still proportionately, I mean, percentage-wise, you're still making money on it. You're not going to lose. If we give away the whole thing, if we have no recourse, we're not going to be able to go back. If we do it in sections where we find this is working, when I first started taking the train to Boston, there was never enough parking. They decided that what they would do is put it in as they needed it. They didn't do a massive thing. We're starting thing. to get a little long, if you right. don't mind. Please. As time went on, I know, but as time went on, they found they needed more. The same is true for Haskell Street and the whole thing. If we start off small, we can always add more apartments. Once it's gone, it's gone, you know, Understood. as they say, um, you know, and, and kind of, you don't know, as they say, you don't know what you've got till it's gone. And to quote, you know, kind of credit my source, Joni Mitchell, you know, they, they paved paradise, they put up a parking lot. I am going to look at that parking lot, you know, I mean, forever. When that song first came out 50 years ago and I was singing it, I never envisioned it in my retirement. I would be looking at what used to be my paradise and as now a parking lot. It breaks my heart. It really does. So, going back, if we slowly kind of do this incrementally, and the town seems to like inter incremental planning anyway, uh, we, can, uh, we, we, we don't have a mistake we have to fix. We can work our way into it. And I would respectfully ask that you consider that. Thank and you. thanks, everybody, for all the work. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Is, uh, yes, I see another hand. My name is Patricia Minton. I live at 3 Partridge Hill Road. Um, wasn't planning on speaking tonight. Um, I was actually planning on going to another meeting that was actually last night. But anyway, <laughs> I'm, glad, I'm glad that I could uh, make this because uh, this is one of the nights that um, my Girl Scouts meet. Um, I'm opposed to this project. Um, it was mentioned earlier that the town meeting wanted something New England style that would blend in with New England. This doesn't. I think that if the project is smaller, it would work with the New England style and what the master plan was looking to uh, accomplish. If we have these 53 units, we're going to have traffic problems. Even though that the um, in, there's a increase, a reduction, I'm sorry, in two bedroom units, we have now uh, studio apartments. I still think that 53 is too much. I think if you cut it to 20, it would be more manageable. You also would have more green space. Shrewsbury's losing green space. Um, 50 years ago, sorry, the town decided to uh, annex Prospect Park for their cemetery. Unfortunately, several scout projects are um, going to be affected by this. Historical um, mon um, landmarks are going to have to be moved. Let's not ruin the town center. Um, I used to live in South Hadley, which had a similar, pro, uh, similar proposal, and it ruined the town center. Even though that it did have Mount Hoyle College that had the traffic, um, it 
just ruined the center. I, Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> Is there anyone else? Yes, sir. Mr. Molina. Jason Molina, 31 Winchester Avenue. Can you hear me? Is it on? Yep. Okay. Sorry. Uh, sorry, Mark. <laughs> um, is this is this true that uh, from the new rendering that there's no there's a flat roof line now on part of this? An applicant on the back. On the on the back. The side. Haskell Street wing. Haskell side. Okay. All right. Um, I'm glad that folks were talking about New England style uh, design. Um, I don't actually see it as being nebulous. It's it's baked into the town center dis district um, descriptions. Um, I know um, Mr. Cahill spent a lot of time articulating all the pieces that he, he gave demonstrations about hey community what are these are the different choices different aspects of that what a new england style would look like solicited from the community got a, formulated into what is now uh, the uh, town center zoning um, uh, requirements so um, i brought this up in the last several meetings so i'm going to be pretty blunt in this question does this board believe that the current architectural design meets that those design requirements uh, in my opinion, um, it would be nice if we could uh, incorporate some of the um, the dormer aspects of it, but in, in listening to the applicant, given the size, it, it could look a little choppy, and to my my untrained eye, just a person, right? Um, I, I actually think it does, personally, but everyone has a personal opinion of what they consider to be their downtown vision, right? Okay. All right. Well, it's well, not, you can ask the yeah, other. Yeah, I, I don't think it's a personal opinion. I mean, it it's in the bylaw. So I I think it fits <laughs> I think it personally myself. Okay. Well, now that it's flat roofing, I'm sorry to say there's other requirements too in the bylaw. So again, don't take it from my word, don't take it from other people's word. It's in the bylaw. So unless they come back with an exemption saying we don't want we wish to not comply with this section don't you have to comply with the bylaw? I mean, I'm sorry, I'm just, that's the way I see it. So I won't talk about it anymore. I think it really has to be no, I, I, aligned I with, with the bylaw. Um, and, and to that matter is, is you know, the, the bylaw is talking about the other furnishings around the windows, furnish, like cornices when it's a flat roof, um, uh, uh, building, uh, making it so that there's articulation, not just vertical, but also horizontally, so it's not looking like the way it is. I, I think it's evolved and it, it looks, it's looking better, but there's still a, a requirement piece of this that I think we're, we're missing, right? That it's not subjective. It is, in my, in my view, because it's in the bylaw, I have to be adhered to. Okay. So then to another piece of this, um, and I mentioned this last time about parking, I see that additional handicapped spaces were added. That's great. I do want to call out in considering other handi uh, handicapped units here, um, on the ground, Floor, there is a handicap unit on the the furthest possible from the entrance, from from where the handicap parking is. Um, doesn't that pose a problem for handicap persons if that was that's if that unit stays handicap unit and the parking is so far away from a ramp and further away? So I think there's I don't know is this does this board review at that level of detail and get involved in that? Um, I, Personally, no. Um, okay. I think they give us additional information that they're not required to. Um, okay. I know I remember going through this when the Firestone was being built. They had such detailed plans, I was like really enthralled with it. And then okay. I discovered very soon afterwards that's really, we're really concerned about the site circulation. So okay. the parking being close to an entrance, that would be something to consideration, which it is. Where that individual may go inside the building, we, we cannot control. They have no access within the building. If I'm reading this right, their only access is through the exterior, and you'd have to go all the way around the building in order to get up a ramp. Again, I we don't define okay. where. Well, first of all, we don't define a handicap room. I don't believe we actually have that in our standards, right? Yeah. So, so handicap accessibility, it's a it's somewhat of a fine line. But, you know, we do do our best to review it to make sure that it's on the plans. But um, ultimately, that is a building code and architectural access board issue. Um, there will be further plan refinements during the building permit phase um, for those specific details of where exactly the, you know, the handicapped spaces are going. We also monitor that with um, planning approval that if the, that 
requires any significant changes to comply with that, they may have to come back to, to modify or provide a de minimis change request. Okay. All right, thank you. And then lastly, um, I know that there was one applicant, so you, you go in with the applicant, right? There's only one to, to work with. Um, but the RFP was pretty clear about what the, what the town wanted, what the select board was synthesizing, what the community wanted to have uh, in relation to um, retail space on Maple Avenue. So there's still a significant amount of residential amenities that are on Maple Avenue. Don't you have some leverage here? Does the board think that this is okay, that we just ignore that part of the RFP and not leverage, not use that as leverage to, to change the unit size, the unit amounts, and to push the residential out of Ma Maple Avenue and increase the, uh, the, um, the, re the re retail space that was originally in the first proposal that they gave us all that warm and fuzzies about, great, as a town meeting member, I looked, I, I stuck my, my stake in the ground on that first proposal that showed wonderful the fix was going to come and this amenity and good, greater good. And I know those are just concepts of like some potential retail, retailers to come. But it was a grand vision that I certainly said, yeah, let's do that. That's, that's going to be a great downtown. But what we have now is not what we had then when we said yes, well, at least when I said yes. So now that we're here, again, doesn't the board have an, an opportunity to use that as a lever? Lower the units, give us the retail that we asked for. I'm just asking if, it, if you have the opportunity well, to do I that. Well, I think we've, we've shown that because the agreement that was originally um, decided between the select board and the proponent has changed already compared to what the board, after the RFP, the board went through and they, they had their evaluation of, you know, they wanted a certain amount of units and they negotiated another set and we've renegotiated that. So we have some leverage. I wouldn't say that we have carte blanche leverage. But these are, and, and, and thank you for everybody for the ideas and things. These are all pieces of information that are going to fall into my stool in my head and I'm going to be balancing them all around and, and I'll come up with a decision based upon that. Um, but to, you know, when you ask a direct question and I'm not prepared to answer a specific thing about a particular um, zoning article or, or a bylaw, um, it kind of puts me at a little bit at ill ease, right? Because I'm, I'm, I'm looking more like you are holistically you know what's what's the whole project bring so that's 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 where I am and and again you know the uh, I think the feedback from the public over these many meetings I think it's been listened to certainly by this board we've reflected that in our views to the applicant I think the applicant has been responsive to those um, I know that a lot of the major challenges this started at seem to be in a much uh, more um, they've been addressed to the point where the the anxiety level, I think, can, has dropped down quite a bit I, for myself personally. Um, for many of you, I believe I heard comments saying that the same. So I think we're going through the process of understanding what this is. And we could regurgitate all of the everything for months and months and months, but it's not necessarily not going to change anything other than just more information, right? So when we get to the point where we think we have adequate information, We'll, we'll have to kind of stop everything and say, we've got the information, now we've got to think about this, and we'll come up with a decision. And to Mr. Rodelakis' um, uh, earlier comment, this is the uh, approval process, and approval meaning the operative word, where it's generally approval with conditions. But we could also come up with approval with conditions that not all the board members are going to agree with. So we're, we're getting closer to that point, I mean, really close to that point. So I just want to you know, echo the some, my sentiments that, you know, I hear you, I do, and I'm balancing all of that inside my head with, with everything associated with this project. Okay. Well, certainly, uh, you have a big task ahead of you. Thank <laughs> you. Sorry about that. <laughs> uh, and I will say that personally, I, I do support the project. I mean, it's a, great, it's, it's a great opportunity for our downtown. It really is. And I, and it, you know, I think once uh, we have great investment in our, in our center, we're going to see the next project, the next project, and it's going to be transformative. I really believe that. I just want to maximize this opportunity to the best of what we asked for in the zoning bylaw and from the RFP perspective. Because again, those, that was a synergy of all that's been talked about for many input sessions and came forward in that RFP and again, the bylaw. So I just want to see that happen. The RFP, 
the next gen the, the next step from the RFP was an agreement between this the developer and the board of selectmen. So we can't say we can't get inside the agreement between the selectmen and the developer and say, "Oh, you really didn't follow the RFP." That's not our job. Okay. We as the uh, planning board have to evaluate the project based on the criteria, criteria in the zoning bylaw for a special permit and site plan approval. It's not our job to say, well, well, applicant, you're varying from the terms of the RFP because the RFP has been superseded by an actual written agreement between the Board of Selectmen and the applicant, which we have to act in good faith toward, you know, that that's who the applicant is right now. So we have to act in good faith. We can't try to undermine their agreement with the Board of Selectmen. But that said, we don't have to approve something. Uh, we don't have to grant the special permit. There's nothing in the uh, agreement between the Board of Selectmen and the uh, applicant that says, oh, and by the way, uh, the Planning board shall approve a plan that provides a minimum of X, Y, and Z. That's no. That's the applicant is is at has that. That's the risk the applicant takes in moving forward. Okay, no, that's fair. That's fair, and I, I appreciate your comments on that. Um, I, I think as you look at units, right, some, something's going to replace that space, right? So if you if you push on the unit side, oh, geez, you got a vacancy in there. <laughs> that sounds like an opportunity for a retail space, right? So. From that angle. But, but like I think Mr. Thomas said at the beginning, at, at the initial hearing was, we all come home and we find a stoop full of boxes. So we all kind of have blood on our hands as to the death of the traditional retailer. So <laughs> you, you can't, I don't, I don't know that we can ever close that box. All right, good point. Thank you. Okay, right. thank you. Yes. going to do a 20 minute speech. <laughs> I don't, I don't think <laughs> that'd I, be short. I don't yeah. think I need to. I, everything was covered, but um, I, I guess I'm going to speak to the developer. Um, first of all, the building um, complies with zoning, and I'm, I'm sure that the building inspector will verify that when, <laughs> when she gets to look at it. I have no doubt about that. Um, the other thing is, um, there's no residential on the first floor. There's a community room um, on the right end of the building that, um, and the developer can jump in, that um, is gonna be open to the public for community use. So it's not, it's not residential. It's a, it's, an, it's a public community room. It was part of the residential and they're gonna make it open for community space, so. Um, and I personally have had numerous um, discussions with uh, Mr. Consigli about, about the uh, town center district and having to stay, you know, true to the, um, <coughs> to the design criteria. And he assures me that they have. The Dorma thing came up, and that's one of those gray areas, but the rest of it they have. And that, that design criteria, there's, there's like, you shall, you can, and that kind of stuff. So it's, it's not as clear cut as it might seem, but um, I know they've done their best to, um, to, to meet the criteria. And we have, don't we have an architectural peer reviewer? So we've had an architectural peer review. I also did review line by line the architectural criteria in um, context of uh, what was proposed. I do see it um, as meeting um, all of the requirements um, as they're written in my interpretation and reading of that language. Um, in terms of the dormers, um, the gray area is, uh, in my opinion, um, related to the design of the roof, which is normal uh, and part of the requirement, um, where um, they have the var variable <coughs> roof lines, um, which is a requirement that the roof line be broken up. Um, it has the flat roof as well as the uh, pitched roof and the dormers are only required on the pitched roof of the Haskell Street side. However, being that it's a flat roof, 
um, that's where that interpretation comes that it's you know the the pitch is actually a faux pitch on that front portion of the building um, designed to you know primarily to hide mechanicals again requirement of the architectural design so the architectural design criteria are very complicated um, and um, in some ways kind of marry into each other um, and not always in a, in a clear cut way and I think that um, the architectural design um, that has been provided is a, is adequate and meets the criteria of uh, the zoning bylaw. Thank you. Is there any other audience member who should be heard? Yes, sir. So, uh, thank you for giving me a chance to come back and uh, and, and hit you again here. Uh, just. Uh, I think two really quick things and then uh, if you give me 30 seconds because the RFP thing's been driving me crazy and I apologize Mr. Berlickis I know you've already put it out of scope and everything else. But, um, as someone who's done this for a living I just retired but, you know, for, for 20 of my 40 years um, RFPs are wonderful things if you're buying three years worth of police cruisers if you're buying the next generation of laptops they're terrible things for things that are open-ended Things where you're not actually sure what you want, but you're willing to kind of chat about it and see if uh, if you if you get it in the end. Um, uh, it just it doesn't it, they don't work well. You don't get choice. You don't get synergy. You don't get leverage in negotiations and things like that when you issue an RFP and you only get one response. So it may happen. There may be existence. Uh, existence proofs when um, when that has happened in state procurement and, and things like that. I'll tell you at Dell or at EMC, a one response RFP would be rejected out of hand. It's a sign of a bad RFP or a bad marketplace. In the middle of COVID-19, we had a terrible marketplace for real estate, for restaurants, for fitness, for all the things that you wanted to put there. So bad data came from that RFP. Unfortunately, we're making high confidence we're required to make high confidence decisions based on that on that bad data right now. I'm really glad that we didn't subject Prospect Park to own response RFP or the Allen property or the Centec work or those kinds of things. I don't know where we'd be today, but those properties would be off the books and built up with apartments. So uh, just sorry, that's 30 seconds on RFPs. Had to get it out. I appreciate your patience. The two other questions that uh, that uh, folks asked me to bring up, one is. Um, uh, uh, I'm glad that Mr. Michaud and, uh, has gotten together with, uh, uh, with the other traffic and, and parking analysts to sort of agree on numbers a little bit. It sounds like that's getting closer. Um, to what extent do the traffic studies anticipate the arrival of the other things in the, um, uh, in the, in the uh, master plan, like bike lanes and like additional uh, pedestrian traffic and therefore uh, crosswalk activations and things like that in that plan? As that seems to be a significant, have a significant downstream impact, secondary impact. I know Mr. Michaud said that uh, this project doesn't independently trigger those, those sorts of things, but I think the broader, uh, your broader context for the uh, special permit granting authority is uh, what, the, what is said in the master plan, and so I wanted to bring that back to the forefront. Mr. Michaud. Um, the project has um, evolved and included elements that are consistent with uh, multimodal transportation components that are consistent with st current state policy, Mass DOT policy. Uh, Maple Avenue is a state jurisdiction roadway. The proponent um, anticipates the reconstruction of uh, portions of sidewalk, um, which through that process will be subject to an access permit right, through Mass DOT, and would relate to things like ADA compliance and compliance with current state standards for mobility. Um, and uh, so I'm confident, based on what I've seen for the plan, that they are consistent with the objectives that have been laid out, you know, by MassDOT for this area generally. Um, what this applicant is not able to do, nor is it impacting necessarily, is any future plans the state might have for bike lanes, for instance, along Maple Avenue, but elements of the plan uh, would allow for integration with those types of elements were brought forward by the state. Um, as to, you know, what might happen with, you know, additional pedestrian activity in the downtown area, 
Um, all of the, um, the, the pedestrian crossings that currently exist are compliant crossings, so to speak. It doesn't mean that they can't be improved over time. And, and an example of that would be the conversion of um, standard walk, don't walk indicators to countdown clocks, for instance, right, which are a little more modern and, 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 uh, and uh, effective in some ways. Um, it doesn't mean that that can't happen, but I think it's beyond the scope of an individual project to necessarily implement those types of improvements that, you know, that might come to board, bear. So I, what I would say is that the site um, is being designed in a way that allows for it to be integrated into that longer term plan as things evolve, whether MassDOT or the town opt to advance those types of other improvements is really you know, up in the air. Uh, so it's, it can't be necessarily tied to the project. So it's fair to say the plan has some flexibility but doesn't explicitly anticipate that? Yeah, I, I think the inclusion of bike parking, for instance, uh, in the project, the, um, the way that they've laid out the sidewalk connections within the property that connect the building, retail points, building entry points to the public sidewalk system. Um, we've uh, suggested and the applicant has provided a different design treatment of the driveways, for instance, um, by <coughs> providing a continuous sidewalk through the driveway. Um, you know, that are, are more modern standards that are more pedestrian friendly, mm. right? So the, all of the elements that we've seen and that have been incorporated here, we think comply with good practices in today's environment. Once you get external to the project, right, right. Um, you know, this is compatible with that. Um, it, 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 it can snap in with an improvement of offsite elements like improved crosswalks, for instance, but sure. it, it's not independently proposing to do that external to the project. Does that answer your question? Yes. Yeah, I mean, the primary focus of my question was about the traffic angle, not so much about you know, whether there were bike racks or things like that, but mm -hmm. a bike lane takes up an automobile traffic lane. Does that have a downstream impact on wait times at oh, Maple sure. Street, right? Yeah. Do additional pedestrian crosswalk activations uh, you know, because we've got a really popular, you know, thing happening, you know, uh, suddenly make, you know, uh, Maine and Maple unpassable for an hour, you know, uh, right. because we've got so much pedestrian traffic crossing all the time. You know, you've been in New York probably when you've tried to cross, the, you, know, you know, across the street and everybody, the, the cars are, are knocking you out of the way, right? So, yeah. So um, I, I'll say that, um, you know, so recently, and I'm sure uh, folks who live in town here can appreciate this or not, uh, is that you could once at one point park along Main Street. Uh, you can't do that anymore. Um, that's an outcome of the current philosophy and approach that DOT and communities at large have to um, to reduce or to to open up um, capacity for for traffic flow for one, but also to uh, to ac better accommodate pedestrian and multimodal aspects of transportation. Right, so is a balance point here. Um, I think the downtown is evolving. Um, the uh, elimination of curbside parking is, is one of those things that is falling into that category, right? So as, as communities like Shrewsbury are attempting to enhance capacity through downtown areas by, say, eliminating parking and opening up travel lanes and reducing friction between parking, that's, that's an outcome. It also opens up opportunity for uh, shared bike lanes and things of that nature, although that doesn't currently exist right now in the downtown area. It doesn't mean it might not happen at some future date. Uh, Which might bring some of that friction back again. Uh, yeah, so it, it, it's certainly a balance point, but you know, and um, when I started my career 35 years ago in, in transportation, it was all about cars and moving cars, right? And now it's all about um, equity uh, and, and making sure that, as you've heard other folks who live in town here say, uh, uh, being able to walk somewhere that's um, ADA compliant, safe, and efficient, or bike somewhere for the same purpose, right? So there were, uh, or take public transportation. And in that vein is another example of how the site has been adapted to accommodate multimodal uh, aspects. They have identified uh, an area where a bus shelter could be placed, for instance, to encourage that type of a use. This site is at a bus stop. Worcester Regional Transit Authority. 
Um, and we would hope that as uh, more residents live here and approximate to public transportation, that that would uh, generate additional interest in those types of modes, right? So this, this site, as one example, is attempting to encourage that, right? And so it's, it's that, the bike lanes, the integration of sidewalk systems, um, how they're designing the sidewalk systems to cross driveways, all of that speaks to trying to achieve a multimodal transportation environment, you know, and, and we think that's the right thing to do. Mr. Misho, this section of uh, Maple Lab where the project fronts on is State Highway. It is, correct. So even if this board wanted to, we can't condition the applicant's special permitters or site plan approval on them improving the State Highway. Correct. That, that, that's violent of the Massachusetts that's law. That's right. It's we really can encourage it. them to go speak with District 3. <coughs> we can't condition the permit. That, that's right. And, and this project, I don't believe, requires any state permits other than the access permit. So it does not trigger MEPA, correct? For MEPA in particular, it does not trigger. The, the way MEPA could require that the applicant uh, make certain improvements to the state highway or, or, or pursue those. This board can't. I'm always stepping out of scope. <laughs> so last question, if I may. Sure thing. Um, it goes back to um, if where, we, where we started and we said, you know, what's the definition of mixed use? What's, you know, is it, you know, it's, it's clearly not 6633 or, 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 or whatever anymore in, in, in this case. Um, and, uh, and elements of, of what criteria the board's going to use um, on some of these, um, some quantitative and some qualitative elements that you're going for. Uh, Mr. Blay, you've talked about your stew analogy and uh, whatever the last ingredient is you toss in your stew before it's done, Paula probably knows. You know, that's, that's, what I, that's what I want to talk about now. Um, what's the baseline comparison that you use for um, parking? I bring up parking again. Uh, I read the, uh, the Wall Street Journal article uh, myself. I think it's uh, much more applicable to the gentleman from Fidelity who was here earlier talking about putting something useful in the middle of that pavement uh, down on uh, Grafton Street than what we're talking about in the town center. Be that as it may, um, uh, there's in December, I think there was discussion of, gosh, we have 2,000 parking places that are only 30% utilized. What's the problem? We hear we can hold the, the Yuletide uh, uh, event uh, and get 2,500 people in and out of downtown. You know, what's the problem? To me, that's like saying uh, Foxborough can host eight Patriots games a year, so that must mean Route 1 is a walkable park once you know, destination for the rest of the year. Those aren't applicable analogies. The applicable analogies are park once, walkable, multi-stop while you're walking, destination where you're coming from elsewhere. It's not about the 1,500 people who are already within walking distance. It's about the destination thing. It's about bringing visitors, bringing your family. It's about the rest of the community, right? the other 38,000 of us or whatever it is, uh, you know, to, uh, you know, to, and, and more, to be able to, to take advantage of that. So that's why parking keeps coming up. It's not, hey, I walk to the town center all the time. I live on Red Coat Road. It takes half an hour, I bring the dog, we have a good time. You know, it's not about not wanting to walk. It's not about being a Luddite stuck in my gas guzzling car or anything else like that. It's just about, you know, you want to have that destination there. People are going to have to put their automobile somewhere to get close enough to the destination to take advantage of it and activate it. And if our plan relies on a parking uh, study that says Francis Gardens and Town Hall and St. Mary's are all equal in equal play as far as parking uh, inventory is concerned, that's a flawed assumption to start from. So as you look at this and say, this plan has to demonstrate a significant improvement in parking, right? So let me ask you a question. For me, yeah. for this specific site plan, I'm looking at the parking requirements for the site. I'm not looking for huge enhancement for the downtown area. As a matter of fact, you referenced parking areas that are not part of this process whatsoever. Of these, they were they were brought in here. In they December. were brought up as there is ample parking elsewhere. It's not part of this site plan review. It's just it was conversation, right? So for me, I'm looking at site circulation. Is there ample parking for both the retail and the um, uh, 
residential portion here, understanding that this particular site has um, an element of enhanced parking for the general area, which I believe it does, given the numbers that we have. So mine is about the site, not necessarily beyond where I think you're thinking like the whole downtown area. Yeah, That's, and I, and, and, and again, we're here for the site plan. I understand. Channeling my Mr. Molina, my inner Mr. Molina for a second. Um, the, the special permit granting authority says you'll consider the town center as you make these decisions, and they must demonstrate a significant improvement to the functioning of the town center beyond and, just and, the site. And given that, given that, given the fact of what the parking requirements are estimated, which, listen, we, we, we all have guiding principles that gives us information that we make decisions from, right? Based on that, and based on the fact that there's ample parking for that, in addition to a free parking that'll be available for everybody else, that does enhance, for me, the general downtown area. Granted, all in one particular area, I think it, we're not thinking that this is a magic wand that's gonna solve sure. the parking, one parking extra, situation. I, I apologize for interrupting you, I'm sorry. But, no, it's okay. Uh, one extra space is an enhancement. The criteria say significant improvement and the, and the baseline, is, is the baseline area is the town center. So I would just encourage you to think hard about the standards because when the laws were changed, the zone, new zoning was put into place, and, and all those expectations were set in 2020 when, uh, uh, when, when town meeting uh, you know, moved all those things forward, it was because this would hand, get handled holistically <coughs> with a town center wide lens on it and not applicant by applicant. So I, I'll leave you with that right. thought. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Appreciate Thank you. your time. Thanks a lot. <coughs> Is there anyone else in the audience who wishes to be heard? Okay, seeing no hands. So we've been, we've been at this for quite some time. Um, I can tell you myself, I, I, I think I have enough information. I'll, I'll ask the board, is there any, any particular report or information that the board is waiting for or if it needs? Mr. Jerry. Um, I'm just curious because it's come up a number of times. Would you entertain an increase in the commercial space or a further reduction in the unit count? Or is this sort of your final? This is probably the final iteration, uh, just relative specifically to the 7,000 square feet and the 53 residential units. Thank you. Mr. Rodelakis. Sorry, thank you. You have, have enough information. Have enough information. I think we have enough information. Okay. Uh, is the town the awaiting any additional information or any additional reports? No, uh, they've submitted all the required uh, reports, and if the board is satisfied with the information they've received, we are as well. Okay. And as I mentioned a little bit earlier in the meeting, I mean, we could bounce this ball back and forth forever. Um, I, I know that we've talked at length repeatedly on many topics and some new and it's all well and good, and I promise you that my ears have been open throughout that whole process. Um, so given that, I, I, I believe we have enough information for us to start thinking about this. So at this time, um, I would entertain a motion to close the public hearing. I move that we close the public hearing on the 1 to 7 Maple Avenue Beale Commons site plan approval and special permit. Do I have a second? Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Okay. What we do not have is a draft decision. However, I know there's a draft decision going under, uh, going under review at this moment. Um, what I'm going to ask is um, when that draft decision is available, that the town planner will email that to the board members and I'd ask that you each review them. If you have any questions or additional um, comments about that or any any specific condition that you would like to have added I'd like you to please forward that all to the town uh, planners office and um, have it so that we're ready to discuss it uh, for deliberation at our next time that we can get together is, is that something that it seems like now that we have a meeting next Thursday is that something that do we think we can have a decision drafted I do believe so. Yeah, so we do have a draft decision. It was not circulated to the board. I do have it um, out being reviewed by town council currently. So 
Um, I do anticipate to have that back uh, in short order, and um, we can certainly include anything else that's required. Okay, so why don't we um, await that notification, take some time, review it. Again, thinking about all the prior meetings, that now it's time, it, we're, we're shut off for, for comments at this time. Um, keeping in mind, the fortunate thing for us is we have our own cable company here. We can review every one of these meetings, and you can as well. Um, I can tell you several of them went very long, so uh, it's got the popcorn. It's gonna, you're going to need it, okay? Um, if you have any questions about prior meetings or <coughs> anything, just to get your mind settled on where you are, and I think we can be in a position to have a vote. We have a special meeting scheduled for Thursday, the, sixth, uh, the 13th, 13th, at correct. which time we will deliberate and presumably vote on the decision. That would be my expectation. Is everybody okay with that? Or? I am. You yes. okay with that? Yep. Okay. So, so we will do our, our due diligence and um, review all the information that we have. We'll get a document with the... Um, decision with any and all um, uh, conditions that may be involved, and then uh, we'll deliberate a week from today. Okay? So with that, I'll ask for a motion to continue this public hearing to, or the, to just continue this hearing for deliberation until next Thursday. I don't know that we have to do that. But no, we don't have to do it. Okay. You know, no, right, I, well, I'll do it just protectively. Right. Um, I move that we continue uh, the discussions on the 1 through 7 Maple Avenue, Beale Commons, site plan approval, and special permit in light of the fact that the public hearings can close and presumably our deliberations to Thursday, uh, April 13th at 7 p.m. Do I have a second? Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. <coughs> Excuse me. We have to make a decision now that the public hearing is closed, but then... Yeah, 90 60, 90 60, 90 60, 90 60. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right. I lost my. Uh, uh -huh. We're not done yet, Steve. We're still going. Oh. No. We're still going. <laughs> no, we still have more work to do. We're gonna let everybody. We're gonna let everybody leave first. I got one. No, no. we have more. So as, as you uh, exit, could you please um, hold your conversation until you get outside? We just have a little bit more to cover. Thank you. That won't happen. No, that, that's <laughs> not going to work. Out. Give it a try anyway. Try yeah, you're going to try. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Our, uh, right. It's quieting down a little bit. Okay, our next item of business is a continued public hearing for zoning warrant articles annual town meeting for 2023. Mr. McGoldrick. Um, yep, so we still have the two zoning articles. Do you want me to go through them uh, in detail again or um, no. it, not, just I generally? Think high level because yep. um, yeah. we did have some <coughs> residents last time asked questions. Yep. And yeah, so the two um, zoning articles continued from last meeting. Um, are uh, the first one, Article 51, uh, for non-gasoline sales. Um, so that's directly related to um, the proportion, um, that uh, footnote in that section that requires that a there's a maximum square footage for non-gasoline sales of 3,000 square feet um, for um, portions of, uh, of gasoline sales businesses uh, in the Route 20 corridor. What we're looking at um, is adjusting that to remove um, the square footage requirement. Um, it is not a requirement in the commercial business district. Um, and so um, this will allow um, what is, you know, what we typically call the Cumberland Farms model um, being a larger uh, retail component um, and the gasoline sales typically more ancillary to that, um, which is how modern gas stations typically operate uh, and in line with that type of use. Um, the second article um, is Article 52, uh, Adult Day Health. Um, that's looking at um, essentially, um, uh, you know, similar to a nursing home use, however, um, not with the overnight stay. Um, we have had some businesses that um, have expressed an interest in locating um, in town under that use. 
um, and we currently felt that there was some ambiguity in the um, zoning bylaw in terms of accommodating that use. Uh, this will add the definition for that, um, which is uh, largely pulled from the state license um, for that type of use um, and uh, allow it um, as noted in the um, proposed use table uh, for various districts. Um, I will note, um, not included here, um, but advertised for our May 4th meeting as we have two additional um, zoning bylaw amendments that will be coming before you. Um, that is for um, the battery energy storage as well as uh, commercial rental equipment on the um, Route 20 overlay district. Um, but we can all have a presentation for those uh, at the May 4th meeting. Very good. Thank you. This is a public hearing. Does anyone have questions relative to the zoning warrant articles? Okay. Next item of business is new business. Uh, report back and feedback for Community Preservation Committee. Mr. Rao. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> uh, let me start. Well, this year, this, this year is the first year that we reviewed um, the Community Preservation Committee projects. We got about 13 or so and narrowed down to about 10 and finally we approved eight of those projects. You know, Steve, the chair, was there on the la la last year uh, committee. They drafted pretty good, um, um, what should I say, the, the plan and things like that. So as, um, as the representative for the uh, from the planning board to the CPC, they suggested that I kind of uh, explain to you folks what has been done and then get any feedback from you folks to take back uh, to the committee. Um, overall, like in, in terms of the financial budget, about 800,000 comes from the, uh, the tax revenue and then another 300 uh, matching from the state side. So about on uh, roughly speaking about a million, million, million one um, revenue uh, for each year. That is divided into three major, ca I mean, th th there's a three major categories, historic preservation, open space and recreation, and then um, affordable uh, community housing type, you know. So this year we did not get any on the housing part, but the two other categories we got in a project and we funded them. So in, in terms of um, the housing we didn't get, so that's something that we need to find ways to get better projects on that front. So um, basically just uh, one other thing that the committee suggested that is to check with you folks to see you have any um, proposals uh, of sort as, as uh, part of the planning board that you have in mind that I should take it back to them in terms of any input from you folks, you know. And then at the end of this year, I'll be done and we need a planning board representative for, um, to be on that committee. Starting so, July. Yeah, starting July. <laughs> so uh, again, the, the first year it was learning experience for us and uh, we were just like the planning board here, you know, we were very open in our uh, meeting conversations uh, with the applicants telling them it's, it's this the first year. So we are learning and uh, they have to be prepared for any things that are, like, uh, fortunately we have what they call as coalition for the for the Community Preservation Committee, I think it, it's probably one or two people who are statewide that kind of we can ask them questions and to get some answers and also to be consistent with how other towns are doing that too. So all in all, I think um, it was good experience uh, for us and for the committee. And um, we just this last meeting, early this week, we had um, an information session for public and uh, Jason Molina, who is the chair, did a good job of presenting the whole um, CPC uh, plan and um, looking for some improvements to make. One of the improvements that, that we are thinking of is it seems uh, the town had a special uh, town meeting that's becoming more common and therefore we may be able to open up the project application period on a rolling basis 
so we may be able to uh, get some projects to this special town meeting in the future. So some, some improvements, but again, this is the first year, so we may or may not rush into making right. some significant and changes. You know, we want to uh, give some time. Good. I, uh, now I may miss, uh, have misheard you, but I just want to make something clear. So the CPC has applications that come forward, and they define which ones will go forward to town meetings. Yes. You don't actually perform the funding. The funding is actually voted on by town meeting at a at a special or a annual or special town meeting. Yes. So yep. all, all, all this committee does is is kind of qualify the applications yep. and then bring forth the ones they feel are the ones that are in the best interest of the community and that are likely funded based on the criteria required for the application. Thank you. That's a good clarification. We recommend it to the special town meeting. In, in the form of articles and then the town meeting members vote to fund those projects. Right, yeah. thank you. Right. But does anyone have any comments or anything to give to Perna? No. I, I think I'm also doing a great job, Perna. Thank you so much. <laughs> <laughs> I did it for the first year, you got it for the second year. Yeah. <laughs> so who next year? That's um, the piece. We'll see. Up, for, up for discussion. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> 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 Um, our next item for new business is discuss and vote on issuance of bond for 420 Turnpike. I don't have that bond. Do you have that with you? So I do, yeah, I do have the bond. Um, 420 yeah. 420 Boston Turnpike. Yep. So we have a bond here. Mr. McGoldrick, would you like to? I do, uh, yep. So we uh, prepared a bond for 420 uh, Boston Turnpike. Um, it's largely our standard bond document. Um, we did uh, include for two and a half years is the timeline for that. Um, sometimes the board adjusts that as they see fit, but I okay. feel that that is adequate. But you want to make a motion? I'll stand a motion. I move that. Uh, uh, we approve and execute the bond entitled <coughs> Bond for Site Plan Approval, MAG Real Estate Holdings, McGovern Auto Group, 420 Boston Turnpike. Do I have a second? Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Thank you. Uh, next, uh, am I supposed to sign this one? Yeah, everyone yeah, does. does. Next item of business is to discuss road acceptance recommendations for Cypress Avenue, Glendale Avenue, and Oak Middle Circle. Um, yep, so we have uh, road acceptance recommendations, um, and I know our uh, town engineer, uh, Mandy Truman, is here as well. Um, but looking at Cypress Avenue, Glendale Avenue, and Oak Middle Circle, um, uh, these have been placed on the warrant for town meeting um, acceptance. Um, we see them as largely completed. Um, and uh, just looking for the board's recommendation uh, in terms of accepting them at town meeting. So nothing's outstanding that you can see? No. Okay. Everyone fine with that? Entertain a motion to, I guess. Uh, I move we recommend those reads for acceptance to town meeting. Don't check it. Do I have a second? Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Awesome. With that, we are at the end of our agenda. I will entertain a motion. For an adjournment. Uh, uh, Mr. Chair, oh, if I, Mayor, excuse me one second. If I may, just with uh, correspondence, I had my one oh, letter. Please, thank you. <laughs> my one uh, shameless plug. Um, so, um, <coughs> uh, I did provide a letter to the to the board um, detailing that we have our um, facade improvement grant program uh, now in full swing. The application is open. Um, we are putting together the review committee for that, um, and that letter is inviting any interested uh, members of the planning board to participate on that review committee, please reach out to us. Uh, we'd be happy to, to include you um, on that committee. Thank you. Yep. Sorry, I, I actually had a note on a previous notepad and I didn't bring it with me, so uh, my apologies. All good. Yeah, All, good. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right, with that, I will entertain a motion to adjourn. I move that we conclude this evening's public hearings. Do I have a second? Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Aye.